Committee on Transportation Infrastructure uh, will come to order, ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare recess any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. Should I hear inadvertent background noise, I'll request the member please mute their microphone to insert a document into the record. Please email it to documents, TNI, at mail.house.gov. In July, uh, we held the uh, first part of this hearing, uh, examining oversight of the government's response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic within the purview of this committee. Uh, today, we'll hear about uh, the impact uh, of the government's COVID-19 relief funding and response efforts have had on transportation sector, its workers, on the ability of states and localities to support their communities with COVID-19 testing and vaccination, and on our nation's economy. Also hear from our witnesses about how these efforts can be improved uh, to be even more effective uh, in the future. Uh, the pandemic has had devastating public health consequences for our nation and the world. Um, more than 42 million Americans have been infected, 675,000 have died, um, and uh, the federal government um, was called upon to maintain a national scale response to this crisis for an unprecedented period of time. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has led the way in protecting the health and well-being of our communities. They've helped states and local governments establish community vaccination centers, provide relief uh, for COVID testing, delivered tens of millions of N95 masks, uh, surgical gowns, other personal protective equipment. States and local governments now receiving reimbursement from FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, for 100% of the costs for the safe opening and operation of schools, hospitals, shelters, transit systems, in addition to prevent the further spread of the virus and protect the health of transportation workers and passengers uh, President Biden has ordered uh, masks to be worn on transportation modes, including buses, airplanes, ferries, and other forms of transportation. Um, you know, it, uh, it not only hit the health of our citizens, it obviously directly impacted uh, our economy. Commercial airline demand uh, fell to virtually nothing, uh, affecting revenues for airlines, airports, associated businesses. Today, passenger levels are 25% lower still. Um, than before the pandemic and not looking too good in the near term. Uh, transit uh, ridership on buses, subways, and commuter van pulls across the country has been decimated. Here in D.C., ridership on Metro Rail decreased 90 percent. These declines led to devastating economic consequences for local, regional, and state governments, transit agencies, airlines, airports, among many others. Companies operating shuttle buses, private bus charters were not fit spared. Some were forced to suspend service due to lack of passengers. Some went out of business altogether. Um, it'll take our transportation networks a very long time to recover financially, and they may be uh, forever altered by changing workplace uh, practices. Uh, Congress took unprecedented actions to help cushion the economic blow to these transportation sectors. The programs Congress created, the funding it authorized, helped transit and bus operators, airlines, airports, other companies provide paychecks to their employees, essential transportation services to communities across the country. Federal relief funds administered by the Federal Transit Administration allow transit agencies to keep critical service running, avoid layoffs, provide workers and bus riders with COVID-19 protections. In aviation, the payroll support program uh, provided financial assistance uh, to uh, airlines, actually, uh, to their employees uh, administered by the airlines, uh, manufacturers, and other related businesses for wages, salaries, and benefits. Airports, which also suffered revenue losses, received additional grant assistance from the Federal Aviation Administration for costs such as salaries and debt service. Congress also created the Coronavirus Economic Relief Transportation Services, our CERTS program, so that motor coach, school, and bus passenger vessel companies affected by the pandemic can maintain their payroll and hire back employees who are laid off. These and other pandemic relief programs have helped thousands upon thousands of workers and their families, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So far this year, job growth has averaged nearly 600,000 new jobs each month, although not last month. The economy uh, has also been growing due in part to a boost from pandemic relief spending, with gross domestic product expected to show a substantial increase this year. Governors, mayors, local officials, labor, business, all have applauded the support Congress provided through legislation that stopped uh, the hemorrhaging of the economy. 
uh, and uh, helped to fight the COVID epidemic. Today we'll hear from uh, witnesses about how the federal government's pandemic assistance has helped transportation workers, emergency managers, nation's economy. Also hope to hear their views on how the federal government can do a better job as it continues to help our country uh, recover from the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic and how it can be better prepared to respond to future disasters. Thank all our witnesses for being here today. Um, I look forward to your testimony. With that, I, I yield uh, to uh, Ranking Member uh, Mr. Crawford. I thank the Chair, and I just want to add a few comments. The federal government has spent at least $5.9 trillion to combat and respond to COVID-19. Much of this year's $1.9 trillion relief package masqueraded as pandemic-related relief was really just throwing money at various Pelosi priorities. House committees also just marked up another $3.5 trillion for the majority's reconciliation bill, which, if it's jammed through Congress, will cost American taxpayers about $50,000 per household. Despite throwing around all this money, we still haven't done our basic duty of funding the government, which is hurtling toward a shutdown. This unchecked spending is directly contributing to rising inflation, and Americans are feeling this hidden tax every day. We cannot continue with inflationary increases in prices every month as we have so far during the Biden presidency. Gasoline is up 42%, bacon is up 17%, beef is up more than 12%, eggs are up 10%, and the list goes on. What's worse is despite the high cost of fighting this virus, we still have done nothing to hold China accountable for it. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and thank them for their patience and returning today. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank uh, the gentleman for his brevity. Um, and now we will turn to our witnesses. Um, we will have um, five witnesses. Uh, Mr. Paul Escalatis, President and CEO, American Public Transportation Association, APTA. Uh, Mr. Juan Ortiz, Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, City of Austin, on behalf of the International Association of Emergency Managers. Uh, Dr. Michael J. Boskin, uh, T.M. Friedman, Professor of Economics and Senior Fellow, Hoover Institution, Stanford University. Dr. Wendy Edelberg, Director of the Hamilton Project, the Brookings Institution, and Mr. Greg uh, Reagan, the President of the Transportation Trades Department, AFL-CAO. Thank you for joining us here today um, and look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our full uh, witness statement will be included in the record. Uh, and with that, I would recognize uh, Mr. Scalapis. Five minutes. Uh, good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify today on the federal government's COVID-19 relief and its impacts on public transportation. Uh, my name is Paul Scutellis. I'm the President and CEO of APTA, the American Public Transportation Association. We are the only association in North America that represents all modes of public transit, with the voice of public transportation for both public and private sector members of our industry. Public transportation has always been an essential service for American families. It provides essential mobility options, supports economic growth, improves the environment, makes our roads safer for drivers and pedestrians, and has served critical roles during natural disasters and other emergencies. When the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the lives of every American, transit once again served as an essential lifeline. Public transit systems brought healthcare professionals to the front lines, delivering groceries and medicine to at-risk populations and connecting essential workers to their places of work. Some agencies even provided exceptional services such as delivering COVID-19 tests or retrofitting buses into Wi-Fi hotspots to help students who would otherwise have difficulty accessing remote learning. As states and cities implemented stay-at-home orders and encouraged social distancing, ridership for many agencies fell to as low as 20% of pre-pandemic ridership levels, and many below that. Through it all, healthcare and other essential workers continue to rely on transit to get to their critical jobs. Most significantly, transit workers served as heroes on the front lines. The public transit industry directly employs some 450,000 workers today, and I would be remiss if I did not mention the significant toll that COVID-19 has had on transit agencies' frontline employees. 545 transit workers have been lost to COVID. At the same time, the pandemic has devastated transit agency budgets. 
and we're deeply grateful that Congress recognized transit's essential role by passing emergency legislation to provide significant support for transit operating costs. According to a recent APTA survey, nearly one half of transit agencies stated that the COVID-19 emergency funding helped them avoid a complete shutdown of public transit service. In addition, more than 75% of agencies said that COVID funding helped them avoid layoffs and furloughs. And the agencies today are putting these emergency funds to work. According to the Federal Transit Administration, public transit agencies have obligated 98% of CARES Act funds. More than half of the CRISA funds have been obligated and more than a quarter of American Rescue Plan funds. There should be no doubt that COVID relief funding is being well spent and has been absolutely critical to the survival of transit service during this public health emergency. Public transit agencies are also helping to combat the pandemic directly. Last spring, APTA created a health and safety commitments program for public transportation agencies to implement in their own communities. The goal was simple, control the spread of COVID-19, keep the riding public and our own workers healthy and safe and win back public trust. The program consists of four commitments to specific practices and policies for both transit agencies and transit users. They include following public health guidelines from official sources, protecting each other by taking appropriate precautions, keeping passengers informed and empowered to choose the safest times and routes to ride, and putting health first by requiring riders and employees to avoid public transit if they've been exposed to COVID-19 and feel ill. More than 200 transit agencies participate in the program, helping to protect millions of people every day, which is leading to increased public confidence. At the same time, public transit agencies have made it a priority to do everything they can to help Americans get vaccinated. Transit agencies have done everything from ensuring that their transit employees had access to vaccines to helping the public get to vaccines by establishing clinics on site or providing free rides to vaccine facilities the federal emergency funding makes all of that possible. Just as transit agencies have served Americans during this ongoing public health emergency, transit is well poised to be a key driver of building a 21st century transportation system that will address the challenges of our time, economic recovery, equity, climate change, and global competitiveness. As the nation emerges from the pandemic, transit ridership continues to climb each month. About six months ago, the ridership levels compared to pre-pandemic were about 41%. Three months ago, national transit ridership was at 50% of pre-pandemic levels. And today, transit ridership is almost two thirds, about 63% of 2019 levels. We expect increasing transit ridership to continue as Americans return to offices and become more comfortable resuming normal activities in their communities. As we look to the future, we urge Congress to provide the necessary funding to address the $105 billion state of good repair backlog that exists, which is needed to modernize our systems and meet the growing and evolving demands of our communities, large and small, all over the country. APTA strongly supports the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which makes critical investments in surface transportation, including $107 billion for public transit. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Skalatos. If you could summarize very briefly. Sure, let me conclude with just three facts that we always need to keep in mind with regards to transit investment. Every dollar invested in public transit includes five in economic returns. 50,000 jobs are created for every $1 billion of investment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to answering any questions that the committee may have. Okay, I thank the gentleman, Mr. Ortiz. You're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Defacio, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is Juan Manuel Ortiz. I serve as the Director of the City of Austin Homeless Security and Emergency Management Department. I am testifying today on behalf of the International Association of Emergency Managers, as well as the City of Austin. The City of Austin Home Security and Emergency Management is responsible for preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation for emergencies and disasters, among many other services. In the past 18 months, we have responded to a category four hurricane, a devastating pandemic, a major winter storm that crippled our state's power grid and many other emergencies. My testimony today will provide examples of constructive comments with the goal of strengthening federal, state and local emergency management and improving our ability to meet our core mission in protecting 
our community in emergency situations. Today, I will cover inconsistencies in the application of federal rules and law, the necessity for adequate funding for grant operations, and if time permits, supply chain management. During the, the COVID-19 pandemic, providing temporary protective shelters for Austin's most vulnerable and at-risk residents proved to be one of our most difficult and most expensive challenges. In the wake of an outbreak at Austin's primary congregate shelter facility, the city took quick action and leased six hotels to provide non-congregate protective shelter and isolation facilities for people at high risk of severe disease from COVID-19, including people experiencing homelessness. The city implemented these shelters based on the established rules and guidance from the CDC and FEMA and staff worked closely with FEMA Region 6 to, es to establish the non-congregate shelter program in accordance with the policies and guidelines. Re regrettably, it became very clear months into the process that although the rules and guidance published by the agencies allow the local expenditures to protect our most vulnerable population, our reimbursement from FEMA for the program was at risk because of the inconsistent enforcement of rules from, re uh, from regional FEMA offices throughout the nation. After pursuing the program for over a year, we have received strong indications from FEMA Region 6 that our reimbursement request for our pandemic non-congregate shelter program may be denied. An adverse FEMA decision on non-congregate shelter reimbursement poses serious risk to public health and our budget. The city of Austin has spent 40 million in non-congregate shelters. And as you can imagine, our frustration has grown with the thought of no reimbursement. As we have learned that expenditures identical to ours are being reimbursed in other FEMA regions. This showcases the inconsistencies of in the application of laws across the country. It is critical that FEMA approve pandemic related non-congregate shelter project applications and other requests uniformly across all 10 FEMA regions. Consistency in the application of policy from FEMA on these decisions is critical to improving efforts to protect our residents. I recognize that I am addressing the authorizing committee and that annual funding decisions are the responsibility of the appropriations committee, but I must include a discussion about our funding specifically regarding the emergency performance grant, EMPG, the Urban Area Security Initiative, UASI, to improve the federal state local partnership and our ability to meet our joint emergency missions. It is essential that Congress increase funding for these core programs. EMPG and UASI are the foundation of the local emergency management efforts Regrettably, the sequester and the budget austerity that followed the 2011 budget agreement did not prepare the, did not spare these four programs and funding has not kept pace with population growth, inflation, and most importantly, need. Essentially, local governments are being asked to do more with much less. I know that you are all too familiar with what it means to be, uh, what it means for a community to be at the margins of inclusion in UASI. However, Austin has not participated in UASI since Congress reduced funding for the program in fiscal year 2011. Austin should be a UWASI participant just as we were one decade ago. The met for metropolitan areas such as ours, the best er answer lies not in tweaking the UWASI threat risk assessment, but in Congress increasing funding for the program to ensure that many more Americans benefit from UWASI. Local emergency management programs are historically understaffed, most consistent of just one person and are struggling to keep up with a new demand place upon them with the pandemic. EMPG funding flows to the local communities through the state as a subaward. However, there are no requirements for a state to allocate funds to local communities. And as a result, access to EMPG funding varies from state to state. Even in my state, which is one of the only to have a process to support local programs, we have seen consistent reductions ranging from 30 to 60% in funding over the past 10 years. As you all know, the benefits of UASI and EMPG are considerable. Communities that are fortunate to participate in the program are not just better prepared, equipped, and trained, but also able to benefit from the regional collaboration and cooperation that the UASI uh, If you could summarize, please, program. sir. In conclusion, uh, that concludes my testimony. And as I mentioned previously, I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss these issues with you today. My written testimony provides much more detail on these issues as well as others. I am happy to answer any questions you may have for me today. Thank you. Okay, I thank the gentleman, Dr. Boskin. Dr. Boskin, you recognize for five minutes.
Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, other members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here and speak to you about the macroeconomics of the COVID relief program and prospective new spending. Uh, to be start, so let me start by saying I support policies to mitigate short-run economic pain caused by a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic and help spur recovery as long as the long-run cost is reasonable. As the economy has recovered considerably since those horrible days of spring 2020, the potential short-run macroeconomic benefits of additional spending are much uh, lower now than then, and any additional spending is better focused on long-run societal benefits with spending levels, allocations among projects and financing methods designed to pass rigorous national cost benefit tests. The macroeconomic literature suggests that spending multipliers, uh, quote unquote, are much lower than had been traditionally assumed. Now, the best academic evidence of what the uh, 2009 stimulus bill did had multipliers about one third of what was originally thought by those who uh, uh, analyzed the bill. Uh, spending multiplier of about 0.6. Uh, but America certainly has infrastructure needs. Uh, we need to get good, productive, long-run infrastructure investment. Uh, I attached a table in my written testimony that gives some idea of the scope and breadth and depth of America's infrastructure enterprise. And it's only a modest uh, uh, fraction of proposed spending these days uh, done well, the program can produce considerable societal benefits, but done to excess or with poor design incentives, a plethora of poor return projects, even boondoggles would likely result. As a general guide, the larger the uh, appropriated spending, the greater the likelihood of the laws of diminishing returns and unintended consequences, creating a large set of substandard projects. Uh, ditto the further the financing method deviates from one of already appropriated funds and especially user fees or their gas and vehicle miles traveled uh, tax equivalents that tie uh, the benefits received uh, to the payments made. It should be noted the economy is now above its pre-pandemic level and is growing solidly. While risks remain and we should have a close eye on job growth to make sure unemployment continues to its downward momentum to full employment, uh, it seems to be perhaps around two or three percentage points of employment below where it could be. It does not appear likely to need considerable additional short run stimulus on top of that already provided uh, and in process. Some argue that additional uh, substantial spending would dramatically spur growth and employment uh, with government borrowing rates low, the argument goes deficit finance amounts to cheap uh, way to increase employment. In fact, existing research that is, uh, suggests that's a misguided conclusion. While infrastructure spending may have made for good short run stimulus in the 1930s with much higher uh, excess capacity and unemployment and different technologies for public projects, that's not the case today as Harvard's Ed Glazer has compellingly argued. Uh, the best evidence suggests um, that every dollar of spending would increase GDP about 60 cents, even in a soft economy. Um, of course, when the dollar is financed with taxes, uh, those have costs too, and that hasn't been emphasized enough. Uh, when we raise a dollar in taxes today, or in the future, a present discounted value of a dollar uh, to cover the interest payments on any debt issued, um, the cost rises with the square of tax rates. If we double the tax rates, the harm from the distortions of decisions to work, save, invest, innovate, hire, et cetera, quadruples. Uh, this has nothing to do with doctrinal issues. It has purely to do with the area under supply and demand curves that every student learns in economics one. Uh, the CBO estimate estimates also uh, that the return on public infrastructure projects around 5% is below that uh, for private investments. So should be careful to have very good projects chosen that pass rigorous national as opposed to local cost benefit tests. Uh, a good example of uh, mismanagement of that is California high speed rail using $3 billion from the 2009 uh, uh, Recovery Act. Uh, six years later, that was used to build a tiny initial uh, start of what was supposed to be a high-speed rail project, but it's now blended speed rail because they have to use a lot of existing track, much slower, meeting massive technical difficulties, epically mismanaged, and the total cost seems to have at least tripled. Um, so we have to be very careful about what we do. In addition, uh, inflation risks are rising. Uh, I think everybody understands their short-run inflation. Our economists are still debating 
How much of that will continue uh, and be entrenched in expectations and continue? I think some of it will, far from all of it. And we should realize that debt is already not only high, but we have large unfunded liabilities in Social Security and Medicare, which when combined are more than three times the regular national debt. Uh, it's also important to note uh, that when we have uh, funding too abundant and not closely tied to national as opposed to local, uh, interest, uh, political incentives exacerbate the tendency to fund too many low return projects. Finally, I would say uh, that infrastructure spending, because it seems to be one area uh, uh, that is subject to bipartisan interest and is likely to be uh, passed at some point, I assume, uh, we need to be careful about doing these projects in a way that adds to long run productivity. Uh, when I'm talking about a national cost benefit test as opposed to something purely internal in a okay. state. All right, Dr. Boskin, if you can, you know, if you could summarize, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A good example would be decongesting ports, which have national, international uh, goods flowing through them, good for the whole country. So uh, while I believe that the stimulus, the uh, COVID relief package help, help cushion the economy and spur recovery. It had limited, modest macroeconomic benefits, but consider, considerable humanitarian justification. And that is the main basis on which it uh, did good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Edelberg, you were recognized for five minutes. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. My name is Wendy Edelberg, and I am director of the Hamilton Project and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Before coming to Brookings, I was chief economist at the Congressional Budget Office. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the economic outlook as the committee and the Congress consider significant infrastructure legislation. I will make three points in my remarks. First, the enormous fiscal support enacted by Congress has been essential to getting the economic recovery on track. Second, the pace of economic recovery, which was rapid in the first three quarters of this year, is creating both opportunities and challenges. And third, more robust federal investment in infrastructure in the coming years will improve our longer term economic prospects. Real GDP has recovered to its pre-pandemic level and growth has consistently surpassed consensus expectations. Notably in the third quarter of 2020, actual GDP was about 5% above the projection that CBO published at the beginning of that quarter. Indeed, CBO now projects that by the end of 2023, GDP will actually be higher than its pre-pandemic path. One primary factor behind the surprising strength and economic output has been the fiscal support enacted by Congress. Despite a continued shortfall in employment, disposable personal income has so far been higher than its recent trend by a cumulative $1.4 trillion since March, 2020. With the ongoing efforts of fiscal support, as well as pent up demand from consumers for face-to-face -face services and a sharp increase in asset prices, economic growth is poised to grow roughly 6% in 2021. Of course, the strength of the economy is entirely contingent on the pace of vaccinations and our ability to control the pandemic. It is also contingent on Congress avoiding a crisis that could be triggered by not raising the debt ceiling. Under current law, the boost to DPI from government benefits should fully wane by early next year as this and other factors boosting household spending dissipate. I expect real GDP growth to slow significantly being just above 1% in 2023 under current law. This brings me to my second point. Although my baseline projection is for a soft landing with GDP merely moving sideways for a couple of quarters, there's a risk that the slowdown could be more abrupt and painful. With growth in demand for workers outstripping the growth in supply, we have seen upward pressure on some wages. Wages for those in the bottom 25% of the distribution are up more than 7% from the pre-pandemic level. At the same time, we have seen bottlenecks and supply chain disruptions for a variety of goods that have resulted in sharp increases in some prices, most notably new and used vehicles. With greater inflation, workers' purchasing power is rising much slower than nominal wages. 
real wages for the bottom quartile are up two and a half percent from the pre-pandemic level. As production has increased and growth and demand abates, I expect inflation to slow overall. Nonetheless, one risk created by the pace of recovery is that certain factors will continue to create inflationary pressure. Thinking beyond the next couple of years brings me to my last point. One channel through which fiscal policy influences long-run economic growth is federal investment in infrastructure, education and training, and research and development. The consensus of the economic literature strongly supports that increases in such investment lead to greater productivity and greater economic growth. Since 1980, the decline in federal investment as a share of GDP has been driven by declining investment in physical infrastructure. Indeed, in 2019, federal investment in infrastructure as a share of GDP was at its lowest level since the mid-1950s. The result has been a less robust and less resilient economy. To wrap up, the expected rapid economic recovery from the COVID-19 recession creates risks to which policymakers should be attentive. Fiscal support has been essential to accelerating the recovery, but now it is appropriate for fiscal policy to turn towards solving more structural long-term challenges. That includes more robust federal investment. The expected slowness and outlays that is inherent to federal investment is a benefit given the current economic projection. Most importantly, an ambitious increase in federal investment in infrastructure is key to improving our long-term economic prospects. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I would recognize uh, uh, Mr. Reagan. Good morning, uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Graves, for having me here today. Uh, I speak on behalf of 33 unions who represent America's frontline transportation workforce. You know these workers. You see them every day building our roads, driving our buses, flying our planes, moving our freight, and connecting our communities. Frontline transportation workers are and always have been essential, but COVID-19 pandemic has put renewed light on what that really means. During the darkest days of the pandemic, these dedicated professionals never had the luxury of working from home. Often they were forced to do their jobs without adequate safety protections like face masks, social distancing, and other PPE. As a result, tens of thousands became ill, scores had to be hospitalized, and tragically, Workers across all modes lost their lives to the virus. Despite the risks they faced, transportation workers reported for duty and helped see us through this crisis. Because of their efforts, hospitals had the critical supplies they needed. Healthcare and other essential workers made it to their jobs on the front lines of the pandemic. And the vaccine has been distributed to every corner of our country. These efforts were possible because of the dedication of transportation workers and also because of your support. Congress provided nearly 200 billion to transit agencies, airlines, Amtrak, state departments of transportation, school bus operators, and motor coaches to keep these systems open and workers on the job. The majority of this aid was included in bipartisan packages that nearly every member of this committee supported. On behalf of TTD and our affiliated unions, I thank you for delivering the federal aid needed to respond to this crisis. In our domestic aviation industry, for example, passenger volume dropped 96% and US carriers recorded massive losses in 2020. The economic damage that could have stemmed from the collapse of this industry would have been catastrophic. However, Congress's provision of three rounds of the payroll support program saved thousands of jobs, preventing carriers from entering bankruptcy, guaranteed that airlines remain capable of transporting essential workers and eventually vaccines, and ensured that this industry would be prepared to respond and recover as demand returned. I wanna thank Chairman DeFazio in particular for his efforts in creating and championing this program. Similarly, in the early days of the pandemic, Amtrak lost its ridership overnight. Shocking 97% drop in passengers translated into an unsustainable decrease in operating revenues. Without the federal government's support, Amtrak, its passengers, and the communities it serves, and its workforce would have faced devastating losses. However, three rounds of financial support with improving labor protections resulted in the recall of all furloughed employees, the return of suspended long distance service, services, and assurances that Amtrak would keep running through the worst of the pandemic. Public transportation was also devastated by this crisis. Many of those working on the front lines of the pandemic, including medical professionals, public safety workers, and other employees deemed vital to the continuance of our society and economy, relied on these services to get to their jobs. Unfortunately, COVID-19 placed an incredible st strain on our ability to provide this public service to those who rely on it most. Across the three COVID relief bills, Congress provided nearly 70 billion to ensure the continued operation of our public transportation system. 
In order to accept this funding, transit agencies across the country had to certify that they would not furlough workers. It is not an exaggeration to state that without this federal support, the public transportation industry would have been utterly decimated, leaving all those who counted on it throughout the pandemic in rural and urban communities alike without the transportation access that they need. The keys to the success of all these investments were the strong labor protections and the focus on worker welfare. Most transportation workers and their families kept their health insurance and were never forced onto unemployment lines. Now, as we climb out of this pandemic, they are on the job, ready to grow our economy once again. While Congress and the Biden administration have taken historic steps to preserve jobs and save our transportation system, unmet challenges remain that still must be addressed. Frontline workers across all modes continue to face the serious and sometimes deadly threat of assaults for simply enforcing face masks and other safety mandates. This is especially true for workers in public transit, on board Amtrak, and in aviation. These workers all have safety sensitive jobs and should not be expected to perform them while under the threat of physical violence. The need to move to a tremendous amount of cargo at US ports placed longshore, shipbuilding, and other on deck workers squarely in harm's way of the virus. Language in the Revised Heroes Act and the American Rescue Plan temporarily revised the Longshore Harbor Workers' Compensation Act to ensure that employees who contracted COVID-19 on the job can collect workers' compensation benefits. Unfortunately, this was left out of the final bills, but it must be enacted while this virus still persists. As we move through the pandemic toward recovery, there is no doubt that our transportation system and the frontline workers who build, operate, and maintain it will continue to play a vital role in ensuring our economy and our country come out of this crisis stronger and better than ever. Unfortunately, we are still not out from under the shadow of this virus. And until we are, we must continue our efforts to ensure, that, ensure the cooperation between working people, transportation entities, and lawmakers. Thank you again, and I look forward to your uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reagan, for your uh, exactly five minute testimony. Um, I'll begin with a, a question to direct both to uh, Mr. Skalatis and uh, to Mr. Reagan, because uh, you both lead uh, organizations that uh, represent one heck of a lot of people uh, in terms of APTA, 1,500 public-private sector member organizations, all modes of public transportation. And then uh, Mr. Reagan, TDD, uh, an organization representing 33 unions uh, who work across the transportation sector. And I, I guess I'd just like you both to uh, what say, and if you can be brief, uh, what was the most important part of the COVID uh, federal relief efforts and the impact they had? And where do you think uh, your industries that you represent or workers uh, would be today if we hadn't had that assistance? Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Paul Scott. Let me let me address that, if I may. Uh, first of all, the the immediate, nearly immediate infusion of federal aid uh, that Congress. Uh, approved for public transit was absolutely essential. It meant that services could continue, uh, bus and rail services to communities, to essential workers, uh, uninter uninterrupted. And, and that was essential in terms of maintaining continuity and maintaining the vibrancy of uh, not only getting people to their jobs, but continuing some level of economic activity. If, that, if those dollars were not forthcoming in the quick fashion that they were, we would have seen uh, enormous dislocation, shutdown of entire systems, and that has been evidenced through the surveys that we've done. Uh, going forward, uh, this gives an opportunity for these agencies to stabilize their operations, continue to operate, and, and begin to plan for the future, and that is what's going on today. It also uh, provided for a continuation of many of the capital investment programs that these agencies were undertaking, so it meant that the private sector would continue to employ people to construct projects, uh, which were in jeopardy if, uh, if those funds were not available to them. So in all, it provided for stability and provided for a future uh, that they could plan for with some reasonable degree of, uh, of certainty. I, I agree with what Paul said, and, and what he said uh, remains true for uh, aviation and Amtrak in addition to public transit. But to me, I think one of the most important parts of the relief was how it was directed toward the workers. It was made sure that we were not furloughing people, we weren't abrogating collective bargaining agreements, we were making sure that people were re retained their credentials to make sure they were trained and up to speed and, and able to return to work when they were there. The fact that we did not have massive layoffs, we did not have restructuring of collective bargaining agreements, we did not have reduction in service, all of this was vital to making sure that we were going to come out of the end of this uh, better or as good as we were beforehand. 
Uh, Dr. Boskin, I, I'm just uh, a bit bemused by your uh, saying best evidence every dollar infrastructure would increase GDP by 60 cents. Uh, 60 cents. Uh, S&P last year did a major uh, report, and they said if we expended 2.1 trillion over 10 years, uh, that uh, the return would be about uh, two dollars and seventy cents for every dollar invested. Uh, the IHS has a study that uh, even has an even higher number than that. Uh, that's the lowest ball number I've ever seen. And you're you're, you're talking about uh, we're at capacity and you know skilled workers not you know. It, when we invest, like the Recovery Act under Obama, which I opposed, all we did was go out and you know, put down a layer of pavement. Uh, it didn't have secondary economic impacts. Uh, contractors didn't go out and buy sophisticated, expensive machinery because you know, they only had these little crappy contracts. Uh, and it was only about a 4% of the recovery package. So if, if we're working off that, it's, it's not a, a good measure. Where, where do you get the 0 .60, 60 cents? It's uh, the lowest I've seen. Uh, well, it's actually a consensus of the best uh, macroeconomic evidence. Uh, for example, the review essay by a highly regarded macroeconomist, Valerie Ramey, uh, in the Journal of Economic Literature, which reviews all the studies, makes them consistent. So Standard & Poor's now, just made, made, made theirs up, or IHS just made up their numbers? No, I'm not accusing anybody of trying to make up numbers. I think people tend to have their own way they analyze this. I'm trying to report the scholarly research it is also, as I said in my testimony, likely that the effect of the CARES Act spending and the COVID relief was somewhat higher than this because of the great uncertainty that was created, the size of the short run collapse, et cetera. Uh, as to the long run benefits, there, there can be certainly substantial long run benefits as I emphasize in my testimony. CBO's estimate of the rate of return on public investment is about 5%, not uh, as in one of the studies you suggested a, a doubling of, uh, of the value per dollar. Uh, there, undoubtedly, there are some projects that's true of. There are others like uh, the California High Speed Rail, which if anything- had a yeah, Well, that's, return. that's I, I will grant you that uh, example, but my time has expired uh, with that. Uh, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I wanna stick with you, Dr. Boskin. Uh, as we've discussed, government spending in response to COVID-19 has reached the trillions we're continuing to debate even more spending today. However, back home and across the transportation industry, I keep hearing from employers that they have an abundance of jobs and nobody to fill those jobs. Has any of this spending incentivized Americans to get back to work or do you anticipate more of the same with employers struggling while people continue to stay home? Well, that's an important question. There are over 10 million job openings listed by American employers and there are uh, millions of workers still on the sidelines who have not come back into the, uh, into the labor force or in, uh, to find productive employment. Many reasons for that. Some of it should abate with um, school reopenings and, uh, and so on and so forth and greater vaccinations, less fear, but probably some people retired and won't come back. Uh, so we have, a, we have a, in some sectors in particular, a substantial worker shortage. Uh, that's, uh, there are also bottlenecks globally that are causing problems. So I think that uh, many of these things were payments unrelated to work incentives, um, made it, uh, in, a, in my view, ex ante, a very sensible thing given the crisis, the uncertainty, the massive suffering. I think it was quite reasonable to try to flood the system uh, and, uh, and you know, to try to cushion things. And even at point six, you know, $6 trillion of spending uh, does something for GDP and output and the demand for labor. So I don't mean to suggest that's a, it's not zero and it's not negative. It's, uh, it's a mo modest amount. But I, I do believe that as we look at these new things that are being proposed, it is a substantial concern that they're not better targeted, less costly, uh, and in, in some, for some of these things uh, have uh, work requirements or training requirements or education requirements. So people are getting the assistance are doing something to encourage their future productivity and work. You drill. You you um, address this in your in your comments. Want to drill down on it a little bit more? What what are the risks from higher debt, and when would you expect that to really start to manifest? When when would we expect to see that start to occur? Well, I think the only honest answer to that is nobody can be sure. 
uh, large buildups and, and sustained buildups in debt have often in history and in many different countries been and time periods been followed by sluggish growth, inflation, uh, even financial crises. Uh, we already faced a very daunting task with the uh, uh, unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare uh, hitting us as we're uh, the population aging and uh, other factors. And so that there was going to be a lot of pressure on the budget and everything else and on private incomes uh, to try to deal with that. And so adding additional debt on top of that, I view as uh, considerably risky. Uh, we do have the advantage of the U.S. is the global, the dollar is the global reserve currency, so we probably have a bit of a cushion relative to other places and times. They're not perfectly comparable, but I think the best way to think about it is it's a considerable risk, and in the current macroeconomic environment, it's particularly a risk for entrenching inflation uh, that hopefully will at least uh, considerably be transitory, although there's some probably already built into the cake for the medium term. We shouldn't be trying to add to that, perhaps. Among, among the bad outcomes that can come from all of this is to get back to uh, an inflation stop-go episode where we wind up having to uh, slam on the brakes to deal with inflation and risk another recession. Let me ask you this, you, and you just, you just addressed this, uh, our, our status as the reserve currency, uh, the U.S. dollar being the reserve uh, world currency, is that in jeopardy? I think there's, there's, some, there's some risk medium and long term. I don't think in the short term. To be a reserve currency, which means that uh, when the melees uh, trade with Australia, things are mostly invoiced in dollars, not their domestic currencies. So the dollar plays that reserve role. Uh, the, the problem is that that's not immutable, but in the, what you really need for that is to have very large liquid markets with very thin bid-ask spreads and futures and options and things of that so people can readily hedge their bets. Uh, no other currency is yet able to substantially replace that, although there's a risk uh, with the uh, various ways the RMB is being used, with the euro, et cetera. There's some risk that we will, we will migrate over time to something that is not as uh, the dollar is not uh, so preeminent. Uh, if done very gradually over a very long period of time, that wouldn't be a big problem. If it was done more abruptly, that could be a big, big issue for us. Thank you, Dr. Boskin. I yield back. Uh, the uh, chair of the uh, subcommittee, Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this important hearing. My question uh, is for Mr. Samuelson of the Transportation uh, Transport Workers uh, Union. Uh, Mr. Samuelson, uh, according to your organization, more than 95% of your members almost all of them considered essential workers, never lost a paycheck during the pandemic uh, as a result of COVID-19 emergency relief funds from the government. Can you highlight uh, which federal programs helped your members uh, the most in dealing with the pandemic? And do you believe the transportation sector would have suffered greater consequences without the federal assistance? Uh, and if so, in what way? As the uh, as a labor leader substituting for Mr. Samuelson, I'll I'll answer that. Um, in totality, the 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 aid, the three tranches of aid to to public transit agencies, with the requirement that they do not furlough workers, was critical to that industry. And the same was true for PSP on the airline side and the and the aid to Amtrak as well. Those three programs. Uh, combined made sure that our entire supply chain was in place and that people who needed to use those services and the people who needed to ship goods and services were able to do it, especially our critical workforce in the healthcare industry uh, and with food and, uh, and medical supplies. Uh, that's, that's, that's certainly important to, to understand. Uh, Mr. Scotellis, uh, as you know, the House passed uh, the House passed surface transportation bill, the Invest in America Act provided more than 100 billion to the Federal Transit Administration to enhance and support transit services in communities across the nation. How could this funding have helped transit operators recover from the challenges posed by decreased ridership and revenues and the increased costs brought about by 
the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, let me just say that uh, we as APTA and our transit industry have been staunch supporters of the Invest in America Act uh, for some of the reasons that you touched on. The level of investment uh, for public transit to upgrade and modernize our transit systems and put them on, on a stable uh, uh, foundation. You know, the American Society of Civil Engineers and its report card of infrastructure of all modes and of all types, which comes out every few years, uh, gives the public transit industry a D minus. That is a reflection of the condition of our public transit infrastructure. So the Invest in America Act, and now what is before you, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, would go a long way to helping the industry modernize. And that's what's needed here. It is long overdue. Uh, the investment levels certainly are at a level that we think uh, begin to make progress. Uh, and quite frankly, um, even at the levels that they're proposed, are, are not totally adequate in terms of the need that has been documented both by the federal government in terms of the U.S. Department of Transportation studies, but also by the model for GFW 650, its best features and reliability based on eight months of our internal service data. At the end, what happened to the what happened? Could you pause the time? Uh, what happened? We, can, we, cannot, uh, we cannot hear you uh, responding to the question. Um, we saw Mr. Cat go on. What's that? Paul may be on mute. Uh, I, I am here. I, I started to hear one of the representatives speaking, so I, 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 I stopped. So I don't okay, know if you heard well, we'll continue. Finish what you were saying. Well, I, I did conclude simply by okay. saying that uh, All right. we, we okay. support the, the Investment Act that's before you. Well, can you discuss steps your members plan to take to ensure that they use this funding in the most efficient way possible to get the maximum benefit of these taxpayer dollars? Absolutely. I think our agencies are committed to that. They understand the public nature of what they do, the importance to our communities and cities, uh, and the requirements that they have to deliver those dollars in an efficient way. Uh, and uh, there is no change from that. That has been a longstanding principle and, and uh, a way of doing business for the agencies. I'm very confident uh, that you will see that with any additional resources that come for public transit investment. Thank you very much. I think my time has expired by now. Oh, well, you still have 37 seconds. If the gentle lady would yield to me. Yes, I'm glad to leave. Okay. Glad to uh, yield to the chairman. Yep, great. Uh, Dr. Boskin, I'd like to ask you a real brief question. Uh, we were talking about the dollar as a reserve currency. What would happen if the United States defaulted on its past debts, uh, which is now being threatened uh, on the other side of the aisle? What would what would that do to our status in the world and the reserve currency status and inflation? Well, I think it would cause at least a very severe temporary disruption in financial markets. That could be a ripple through the real economy if we weren't careful. I think it would be very damaging. I'm not going to get into the politics of how to get how to get the ceiling raised, but at this stage, uh, it would be wise to do so. Thank you. Now I'd recognize. Uh, no, Gary. Oh. Graves. Okay. Uh, Garrett Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Boskin, uh, appreciate you joining us today. Um, I, I, was, I was looking through uh, some of the, the Government Accountability Office reports that, that showed that we had, uh, I think, over a trillion dollars, one trillion with a T, dollars left in COVID relief from the, from the previous year. In fact, we did legislation as recently as December of last year uh, that, that provided funds for COVID. Uh, yet this year, as early as January and February, folks were trying to pass a $1.9 trillion additional package under the auspices of COVID. Um, I, I understand your comments about the debt limit, okay. but is it is it advisable for us to be okay, phone, just dumping more money on Sorry. top of uh, uh, dollars that have been unspent to even, you know, to where we really don't even know where things are needed and where the, the, the true impacts or unaddressed areas are? The least harmful to the economy would certainly be to uh, 
to make sure that the unspent funds are come first and are spent wisely. Um, right now, if I, if I go and add things up, if I remember right, let's see, we have a $1.9 trillion package that was done uh, earlier this year. Uh, we now have a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package, a $4.3 trillion uh, reconciliation package, and the annual appropriations process will be somewhere around $4 trillion. Um, add all that up, it's uh, $11.4 trillion, um, and, and we're not even through the year. Um, I understand your comments about, about um, honoring our debts, and, uh, and I certainly understand that, but at the same time, is it advisable for us to be spending that kind of money and further seems, in, incurring greater debts? Uh, the macroeconomics are not advisable. The, they could be somewhat mitigated by a smaller amount spread out as much of this is spread out over a number of years where there are obviously a variety of things that have been called budget gimmicks about things starting late or ending early and things of that sort. But the, the basic idea of having the general scale of the size of our government uh, to be increased, in my view, is probably not wise. We see a, there are many studies documented that documenting that one of the one of the uh, several, but an important part of the reason our standard of living is considerably higher than Western Europeans is we have a more modest uh, size government spending and taxes. Right? Maybe we're at about a third; they're at about a half. Uh, some people attribute all of the large difference. I think that's an exaggeration, but a considerable chunk is put it in, to put it in just perspective that people don't talk about very much. America's real GDP per capita, uh, purchase power parity after tax, is 50% higher than Denmark. That's, you, you don't want to go down the road of uh, a lot of a lot of headwinds for future prosperity, especially for the people having young people coming into the labor force. By slowing growth, on top, the headwinds we're going to face funding Social Security and Medicare and having to deal with their unfunded liabilities in the coming decade. Those those programs, uh, especially where shorter uh, term is uh, Social Security retirement, uh, in roughly in a decade or slightly more, will only be able to pay close to seventy five percent. Mr. Boskin, we're 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 having trouble with your audio. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and reclaim my time here and and hopefully. Uh, perhaps get answers for the record. Um, I, I want to turn to the to the uh, transit uh, issue. Uh, you know, we talked about all this spending of funds. Uh, I believe when you add up the the, the COVID funding from last year, um, you add all the COVID packages. We had sixty nine billion dollars in transit funding. We have, uh, I think, ninety billion. Um, in the in the reconciliation package, another 10 billion in regular appropriations comes out to 170 billion dollars. Uh, transit programs have had ridership down 75, 95 percent. Um, why are we putting so much money into transit when they're not folks riding it? Yet even even in the infrastructure package that's that's being debated, you only have 110 billion dollars in new money for roads and bridges. If I may, uh, sir, I, I I would argue that all of the money we spent on on, on, trans, on the relief money was to maintain services so it was there for the people that need it and they will be there when, we're, when we come out of the pandemic. I would argue that we've been dramatically underinvesting in transit for decades now. I, all you have to look at is that the, uh, you know, the report cards across all of our transportation networks are averaging, what, a D plus these days? So we really need to do the, the big investments to make sure that we are able to be competitive as a country, make sure that we have transportation op options for everybody, whether it be in transit or rail or roads and bridges, because we support that as well. Um, these are necessary investments that are decades overdue. Well, but but why, why should we put money toward transit and not toward roads and bridges? We're putting money towards both. And that's where the way the highway trust fund has been set up has a split to make sure that both are being supplied based on. Um, I'll, I'll, my my time's expired, but I'll, I'll follow up in writing. I have a few few more questions on this topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Ms. Johnson of Texas is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, thank all of our witnesses for being present and let me engage um, Mr. Ortiz. 
I understand that uh, you had some concerns about supply chain issues in terms of gathering equipment. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, yes, um, there has been, um, had there been a prioritization of, on the supply chain and had we been able to seek out one specific source for our necessary supplies, our efforts to provide PPE to the frontline workers would have been more effective and efficient. I think also uh, very quickly we realized there was a need for a national strategy for supply chain management uh, in order to, um, uh, to ensure that we were not competing with other states and other cities uh, to seek out that limited supply of personal protective equipment. Uh, because if not, then uh, we can experience um, uh, supply, uh, those limited supplies to, to increase in price and result in an unequal distribution in a pattern. And if I'm permitted, there is a, an actual example that I can give you after Austin was told by multiple of the nation's largest suppliers that our order for PPE was not large enough. We partnered with the city of Houston and the Texas Medical Center in Houston and we uh, identified supplies uh, that were located in a port in Florida. Uh, and as we were in the process of, uh, of, of, of the procurement, uh, we just be, uh, we were notified about the, about the source that the Texas Division of Emergency Management in Texas took possession of supplies before we could close the deal. In this situation, we find ourselves competing not only against other cities attempting to mitigate a disaster, but even our own state. Uh, and so supply chain is something that I think uh, be becomes very crucial when you have a national-wide pandemic like we experienced so far. Thank you very much. Uh, there are the entities across the United States with similar uh, non-congregate sheltering programs who have had their project um, applications approved. Uh, yes, uh, it is our understanding that uh, state and local governments in FEMA Region 4, four which is in around Florida, and FEMA Region 2 in New York, and FEMA Region 3 in Washington, D.C., have had similar non-congregate shelter projects obligated with a few having funding already dispersed. And one last question on that. Can you expand a little on the local emergency management perspective on why FEMA selected so few Texas BRIC applications? Uh, yes, uh, within Texas, 468 million in total project funding applications were submitted, but no competitive projects were selected. We believe the issue is in large part to be that Texas does not facilitate the adoption of enforce and enforcement of the 2015 and 2018 International Building Code and International Residential Code. However, the city of Austin does follow these codes. In Texas, building codes adoptions uh, take place at the, at the local level. Given the under the BRIC program. To bring this to a larger perspective, all of the nine states and District of Columbia that received competitive funding had an IBC and, I, and IRC 2015 and 2018. There were no states or districts funded without these codes. Well, thank you very much. My time is just about expired. I yield back. Mr. Weber is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate that. And actually, I'm going to discuss some of the points. Where's my uh, bio over here, Doug? Oh, let me get rid of that. Did you give it back to me, Mr. Boskin? Mr. Boskin makes a lot of great points in his discussion. And I want to just run through them real quickly and see if there's time for questions. Um, he support. He said, I support policies to mitigate short-term economic pain caused by crises like the pandemic, as long as the long cost run cost is reasonable. Good point. Uh, he says, in the early days in the detailed evaluations uh, of the economic effects of the several responses to COVID and the main components by independent scholars, he's going to address his comments to the desirability of additional spending, which is what we're discussing here today, and its methods of finance. 
uh, under its methods of finance under consideration. I want to highlight for traditional infrastructure. And when I read that sentence that he wrote, I thought traditional infrastructure financing. So does that include terms like social justice? Uh, tr uh, does that include terms like climate justice? Does that he also does that include terms like you can get more money or a subsidy for a Tesla if the car is built in, in a union shop? Is that traditional finance for infrastructure projects? I kind of doubt it. He says he cites much of the research below as evaluations based on the 2009 ERA Act, American Reinvestment Recovery Act, but some focused on other data periods as well. He says that some claim that there is a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure deficit and others have long blamed inadequate public investment for holding back the U.S. economy. Others argue that a closer analysis shows your infrastructure is much better shape and advocate for improving the allocation of funding. Don't miss that, the allocation of funding over massive new expenditures. And if these expenditures aren't massive, I don't know what is. Well, especially when you've got union jobs in there that we're getting paid for, you've got social justice and climate justice. We don't even know what that means. How does that money get allocated? How do we, how do we figure out if, whether it's appropriate or not? He says U.S. infrastructure forums rate our infrastructure as 13th out of 141 behind Singapore and Hong Kong, but ahead of countries like Sweden and Denmark. So in that effort, we're not, in, that, in my opinion, we're not that bad. He says, but some only of that is, some only of that is appropriately a governmental, and only a part of that is appropriately a federal responsibility. So I repeat, <coughs> pardon me, the way it's being spent and the amount that's being spent is unconscionable and incredibly short-sighted. He talks about the Highway Trust Fund following the expiration of the 2015 FAST Act in his writing. He says the Highway Trust Fund will depend not just on the level of spending, but also the ex-ante quality of the projects funded and their post-execution and their financing methods. Well, I looked up ex-ante and it says it's based on forecasts rather than actual results. Well, who could have forecasted that we would be spending this much money inappropriately uh, and irreverently, I would state. He goes on to say that done well, the program can produce social, substantial societal benefits, but done to excess or with poor design incentives, a plethora of poor return projects, even boondoggles would likely result. You know, it makes me think about the, here we have, what is it, 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations in the bill. And it makes me think about uh, going back to when the gasoline engine was invented in the 1900s. And I wasn't alive then. I know I just looked that up. But I read the history books. And the term for the automobile was horseless carriage. Some of y'all remember that. Well, I remember, you know, reading also in those history books that the, when the gasoline engine was invented in cars, the government went out and they put gasoline stations everywhere. Oh, wait. They didn't. And now we're going to put electric vehicle charging stations? How about entrepreneurs get out there and do that, like they did with gas stations? He goes on to say that it should be noted that the economy is now back to its pre-pandemic levels and is growing solidly. While risks remain, we should keep a close eye on job growth to make sure unemployment continues its downward movement to full employment. It does not appear likely to need more considerable input a uh, short-run stimulus on top of that is already provided in this process. No more is needed, especially not at these spending levels. He makes great arguments. He said, in fact, existing research suggests that it is a misguided conclusion. Page four. Colleagues, read his testimony. He makes perfect sense on what he's laying out. With that, I yield back. Mr. Larson is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I'd also note that uh, economists have predicted nine of the last five recessions. Uh, so um, uh, it really depends on which economists you read, and there are others who are saying uh, different things. Um, but I certainly agree that the economy continues to emerge, uh, but it has not yet emerged. Our unemployment rate continues to surpass the rate before the pandemic. And we're defeating the pandemic, but it is not yet defeated. In my state, we have a very high vaccination rate, uh, but we're also seeing local hospitals 
being crammed by COVID cases in their ICUs, uh, Delta cases, 93% of which uh, are unvaccinated folks. So um, the pandemic being defeated but not yet defeated, the economy is emerging but not yet emerged, and uh, I believe, therefore, we still need to stand up and stand in and help. So my first question is for Mr. Uh, Sutalis. And if you could comment on the impact that COVID-19 has had on paratransit and paratransit riders and what transit has done to alleviate the, that imp the impact on paratransit specifically. Well, as we know, paratransit is essential, an essential service that's offered by most of our transit agencies across the country, and that is door-to-door -door service for those who are either elderly or in need of specific medical assistance. Uh, and this is critical services. Uh, what the COVID relief has allowed agencies to do is to maintain that service uh, for these very fragile, very vulnerable segment of our population. Uh, without those resources, those services would have been in jeopardy. And by the surveys that we have done, we would have seen the complete closure and stoppage of those operations. Uh, but what the relief was able to do was to continue, provide the resource agencies, maintain that service level. And as a result, uh, those, those needy populations were attended to. Uh, and that is the biggest result, I think, that uh, again, we have to think about this in the context of serving people. And this is what the emergency relief did for public transit, allowed the agencies to serve people uh, and the brave uh, workers that uh, delivered those services on a daily basis. Thank you, uh, Mr. That's fine, Mr. Reagan. Uh, Reagan, can you discuss your thoughts why the unemployment rate in March of this year for transportation workers was still nearly three percent above the overall U.S. unemployment rate? Is it specific to certain jobs or professions, and what additional measures can be taken to support those jobs or professions? Sure, I, I um, you know, in, in transportation, you have to look at the at the at individual sectors. I think broadly, um, you know, there are there are different causes depending on the sector you're in. In some cases, it's whether the demand is returned to get uh, full service back in in Amtrak or in in, in aviation. I know that in March this year, um, you know, Amtrak had begun to bring back all of its furloughed employees, but had not had not brought everybody back. Uh, so I'd be interested to see what what they look like in a month or two once we have you know sort of the full impact of all the the relief effort is is there. Any other thoughts though on additional measures that can be taken? Um, certainly, I think investing more in our infrastructure uh, system right now. I, I think the infrastructure bill that has been placed before the House here is is a really good one. Uh, it it would put into place a lot of the big investments that we've been calling for for decades. Uh, we've been under investing and if we're able to do this now uh, and put historic levels of investment into Amtrak, into transit, um, into roads and bridges, all of those things will help bring more people back to work. Right. And Chair, I just want to make a final point, a bipartisan point, that as part of the American Rescue Plan, although there was a partisan vote on it, there was bipartisan legislation incorporated into it. The American, uh, sorry, the Aviation Manufacturing Jobs Protection Act co-sponsored by uh, me and by um, Mr. Estes from, from Kansas. Um, that program utilized $750 million that went to 488 aviation companies, uh, mainly smaller companies, to uh, bring back uh, workers, to protect those workers' jobs, to ensure a uh, continuation of the aviation supply chain in an industry that was especially hit hard by the pandemic. And I just want to note that because there, there was bipart a bipartisan effort to get that bill in the, in, incorporated into the American Rescue Plan. It is being implemented right now. Uh, it is working. And uh, just, I do want to end my comments on that bipartisan note because it, it does happen around here despite uh, what we read. With that, I yield back. Mr. Mr. LaMalfa is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, I appreciate uh, the opportunity in this hearing here. Uh, Dr. Boskin, I, I was, uh, I'm interested in some of your earlier comments and answers to questions here on uh, the whole broad picture we're looking at with uh, congressional, with federal government spending. Um, of course, we had three previous 
big uh, COVID packages, uh, um, part defensible, part maybe not so defensible. Um, more recently, a smaller package passed uh, by Democrats without really any significant Republican input pushed through the process. But it had a lot of additional spending in it, uh, billion, hundreds of billions in additional spending that were really above what was needed. And so we look at this in context with inflation, and I'm glad we're having that conversation as well. Um, we, uh, this, this stimulus bill, can, let, let's, let's step back in time too. You, you talked about in your comments the 2009 ARRA bill that was supposed to be a stimulus at the time, I think or somewhere around $800 billion. That's back when we weren't quite as comfortable with throwing the word trillion and spending around as we seem to be these days. Shovel-ready projects. Uh, can we? Can you? Can you comment on the uh, efficacy, the, uh, the performance of when federal government uh, stimulus dollars just fill up the trough like that? Going back to ARRA, or or more recently. Would you comment on how well that performs and what kind of basically bang for the buck for the taxpayer and uh, what kind of inflation is there involved just on when there's that much money in the trough and everybody's trying to get their piece? Well, of course, the, the 2009, February 2009 uh, ARA passed at a time when there was substantial unemployment. Uh, unemployment was rising rapidly. Uh, there was great uncertainty about how the economy would recover from that. Uh, so when these sorts of things happen, as you indicated in your opening comments, sometimes you need to get something started. It may not be perfect, but I think we can learn from that uh, a variety of things. For one, that the exposed estimates by independent scholars suggest that uh, it costs several hundred thousand dollars per job saved uh, or created, as they say. Eventually, uh, President Obama uh, came out and said, I guess to shove their words, there's no such thing as a shovel-ready project. Uh, so there may be a few here and there, but in general, it takes time to get infrastructure done. It takes, there's only about 5% five, 5 of that was on infrastructure. A lot of it was on transfer payments, paid to state-owned governments, Medicaid support, and so on. So, Doctor, you, so, might, you might say the, an immediate jolt on jobs isn't really there because shovel-ready really doesn't exist to any great extent. I, I think it cushioned the fall some. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, but I think it had much less impact than was being projected at the time. The, um, the uh, adv economic advisors were predicting a multi so-called multiplier of 1.7 ex post seems to have been about a third of that. No, in California, not, sir, I'm sorry. <laughs> in California, right in your backyard, the high-speed rail project was going to blow right through Palo Alto there. And at the time in California, they were touting it as having a million, uh, being a million jobs and soon... Finally, we got out of it, it was a million, a million job years. Uh, comment on, is that is that kind of a uh, poster child for um, the big promises made by this type of, what do you want to call that infrastructure or in general, uh, you know, stimulus spending? Well, I, th I think as a general matter, spending the money six years after the recession isn't going to cushion job loss very much. Uh, so that was poor. I think the funds wound up being spent hurriedly to do something that was unnecessary and unwise given the subsequent information, but they, they were spent because otherwise the money would have had to been returned to the federal government under the terms. So I think that's a particularly poor example. There, there are many other projects that are uh, certainly better than that. I think it's worth pointing out that when you take a look at this kind of thing, um, the, but all the academic literature from Ned Gramlich, a Clinton Federal Reserve appointee, uh, to the CBO's analysis of this, suggests that the highest return projects tend to be repair and maintenance. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's certainly that that should be done. It's a little, it's not as sexy. Uh, you don't have a ribbon cutting. No, no they aren't, but they are very, very needed. How about cash for clunkers? That was supposed to be a stimulus as well for the auto industry and new cars. Remember that one? Yes, I do. We evaluated that. It moved car sales forward a few months and then they collapsed. So it didn't do very much. And the cost per uh, per ton of CO2 re reduction was about 20 times the European Union trading price. Yeah, it's being discussed around here again. So uh, thank you, Dr. Boskin. Ms. Napolitano is now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Reagan, uh, in Congress, I've introduced the Transit Worker Protection Act included in the Invest in America Act, and a version of which was included in the infrastructure bill on the floor this week, which will require the implementation of protective shields in buses and transit vehicles to ensure the safety of drivers. If this bill had been implemented prior to COVID, it could have protected public health and spread of COVID by having barriers in place. What are your thoughts on the Transit Protection Act? How necessary and important is the bill for protection of your, you and your colleagues? And also during the uh, outbreaks of violence against other transportation workers, uh, how does it work? Uh, how, what should federal government be doing to protect all transportation workers? Uh, thank you so much for your, for your question and for uh, the, the consistent support you've had for transportation workers on safety. Uh, yes, I think passing the, the Transit Worker and P Pedestrian Protection Act would have had a significant impact on reducing uh, the, some of the assaults and some of the problems we've seen since the pand pandemic started. Uh, one example here is that we, we aren't collecting data adequately on the extent of the problem. Um, it would, th th this bill would help us collect data on all the assaults, not just the, violent, the most violent ones, which is the case right now, which would really allow us to better examine what the scope of the problem is and where the improvements need to be made. The other thing that it would do is, is basically look to transform the workspace um, in, onside a bus to make sure that the workers are better protected. They reduce, uh, you know, they improve the line of sight visibility, uh, re decrease um, the, the blind spots, and generally make it a safer system for people both inside and outside the buses. Very good. But what about the, uh, the uh, shields? How do they protect the workers? What has it done, like Los Angeles has done it for our uh, metropolitan workers, and they seem to have a very good uh, uh, record of not having COVID uh, transmitted. Yeah, I think, I think shields are an important part of that. Um, they, you know, there are various shields being used at, at transit agencies across the country, and some of them have less of a benefit than, than others. But if you have uh, a reimagined workspace that actually protects workers, I think that would be uh, a really important part for moving forward. And I know there's been a lot of people out there designing these, uh, and the federal leadership is needed here to make sure that they're implemented across the country. Wouldn't it be better to go to the manufacturers and suggest that they implement them in, in this bus sales? I think a lot of it will be done with the manufacturers, but the agencies who are procuring buses are also going to have to, um, you know, require certain specifications that are that are there to protect workers. So, uh, ultimately, the manufacturers are going to be responding to the RFPs and responding to the asks uh, from the agencies from their customers on these on these issues. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Mr. Ortiz. You state that uh, FEMA all too often recaptures disaster assistance funds on the pretext of small violations of arcane procedural rules and regulations, the complexity of which are exacerbated by policy inconsistencies across regions and from year to year. Would you explain a little more about that and how can we help uh, resolve some of those issues? Uh, yes, I, I believe the, the, the main issue is, the, especially in this pandemic, we have a, a, a national disaster that's impacting everybody and, and, and the effort is trying to allow the FEMA regions to, to use all resources available uh, to respond to the, the emergency. The problem exists when we start having disparities from different regions uh, and, and the application of the rules and laws that, that makes it difficult for uh, community, for the, the whole country as a whole to, to be able to, re, to, to recover in, in an effective and, and an equitable manner. I see. Uh, well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, I yield back. Mr. Fitzpatrick is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks for uh, everyone on the panel for joining us today. My question is for uh, Mr. Reagan of TTD. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, please send my regards to President Samuelson. We'll be keeping him in our, in our thoughts today. Um, my question for you, sir, relate to uh, the benefits uh, of uh, transit relief that Congress provided. Uh, transit agencies received a significant amount of federal aid. Uh, what would public transit and all those that depend on it look like today if Congress had not provided the amount of aid that we did? Oh, uh, and thank you, and thank you for your kind words about about Congress or Mr. Samuelson. Um, to be to be frank, transit would have been completely decimated. 
uh, there wouldn't be the workforce in place to support rising demand. We would not have been able to, uh, the rising demand we're seeing now, we would not have been able to sustain operations during the pandemic, especially for those who relied on it to make sure that they were getting to their to their jobs, whether it be in healthcare or in uh, food service or in grocery stores. Uh, so we would have been in a very, very difficult spot. And uh, frankly, if we hadn't had the, the support in place from the federal government, I think we would have been digging this out for years uh, to try to make sure that we would, to bring our transit system <clears throat> back to where they were before the pandemic. Um, second question, um, SEPTA, uh, as you know, in my district and other agencies have uh, continued to invest in electric buses uh, and other types of uh, new capital projects throughout the pandemic. Um, are there any additional actions that are needed uh, to ensure that our transit workforce is ready for the next generation of technology. This is certainly an area uh, that we know our, our society is moving to, to microchips and everything, uh, pretty much, uh, certainly in the area of transportation. So as we uh, proceed in, into this next generation of technology, like electric buses, uh, are there any additional actions that are needed uh, by us to ensure that our workforce, our transit workforce is, uh, is ready for the next gen? Yes, there, there are. Uh, frankly, we've been working, and I say we at uh, TTD and our and our unions have been working with leadership at TNI as well as that in the Senate Banking Committee um, to make sure that that all the funds that are attached to the you know low low emission or EV uh, vehicles will support workforce development development for the next generation of transit vehicles. Historically, we have invested next to nothing in the transit workforce um, and in, in transit workforce training. So this investment will upend that trend and make a huge impact. So that not only um, are we funding the physical infrastructure, but we're making sure that the workforce is ready to operate it safely, uh, make sure that our maintenance is up to speed as well. Thank you, Mr. Regan. Uh, Madam Chair, you're back. Mr. Johnson of Georgia is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for holding this hearing and thank you to the witnesses for your time and your testimony. Since the start of this once in a century pandemic, Congress has acted decisively and passed legislative relief totaling $5.9 trillion. But our work is far from done and we are obligated to ensure that relief aid arrived to the folks who needed it most, especially black Americans, community of color, communities of color and low income groups who have too often been dismissed by the federal government. Uh, Mr. Scoutilus, public transit plays a uniquely important role for communities of color. In 2017, APTA reported that more than 60% of riders are minorities such as Black Americans and Hispanics. And during the pandemic, transit provided a lifeline for essential workers, many of whom are minorities, to get to and from their jobs while also providing critical assistance to minority-owned small businesses. Can you discuss specific examples of how federal assistance enabled your member transit agencies to continue to serve minority populations during the pandemic? Thank you, thank you Congressman, for that question. You're absolutely correct. Uh, the transit services through that pandemic period were absolutely critical in two regards, uh, not only for transporting, uh, many of the minority population uh, to hold their essential jobs, uh, as we talked earlier, uh, jobs at hospitals, at medical centers, those critical jobs uh, at grocery stores. These are the individuals that I often remark, and I think it's so true, that are out there performing their jobs as they had and continue to do through the pandemic, so that the rest of us who have the, the great fortune of being able to, at least for a time period, work remotely, be able to conduct our lives. So uh, those minority populations in every city and community across the country uh, have uh, done just that in terms of supporting the services that are delivered uh, and in terms of operating those services, uh, really bearing the, the risks of being on the front lines and providing the services on behalf of the greater population. So transit services are absolutely essential, not only in terms of the minority population who comprise a large percentage of ridership, uh, but also those who also deliver the services to these needy uh, areas throughout the country and union communities. So your, your comments uh, are right on target and very much what we experience and what we know day to day in talking to our member agencies across the country. Thank you, Mr. Scatalis. 
This past summer, I introduced the Stronger Communities Through Better Transit Act, which would create a new program to provide high quality, frequent public transit. How will federal funding help transit operators recover from the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, such as decreased ridership and revenues? Well, here again, the, the emergency relief that, that you all, that Congress passed, was so fundamental uh, to providing continuity of services. The surveys that we have done very recently of our membership suggests that almost half, if, if not above half of all agencies would have shut down their services entirely. Not only lost jobs for workers, but lost opportunities to service their communities and to service the people that rely on it. So it helped us through this period and it has been a period of survival for the agencies. Going forward, uh, what is being proposed in terms of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is all about modernizing our systems, investing capital dollars not operating dollars, capital dollars to be able to improve these systems to allow agencies to better serve communities of color and communities all across the country that really rely on public transit. Thank you. And sir, what impact would parity in funding for transit and highways have on our ability to mitigate climate change and elevate historically marginalized communities? You know, we have had a pattern of uh, a robust investment in highways over at least a half a century, perhaps longer. Uh, on the public transit side, quite frankly, we have been underinvested, as you've heard from others, including my colleague, uh, Greg Regan, uh, for many decades. And so we are trying to make up the difference here. It won't be made up in one bill or one act, but needs to be followed over a course of a number of years, and I would even say decades to get the public transit systems with the kind of resources that they can have to provide true alternatives and true options to serve our communities and people all across the country. So we are in a, in a deficit position relative to the investment that's needed. And that's not coming just from the transit association, that's coming from independent sources that have confirmed that. And we need to make stronger, larger investments in public transit in the long term uh, to get even close to what the investments we have made in the highway system for well over a half a century. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Nels is now recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairwoman, thank you. And my first question is for Dr. Boskin. Uh, in your testimony, you spoke of the di diminishing benefit of additional stimulus at this point in time uh, of the pandemic. And, and across our entire go government, we know that there are hundreds of billions of pandemic relief money. It's, it's yet to be spent at the U.S. Department of Transportation, for example, the outlay rate for relief money appropriated in the CARES Act and supplemental, the American Rescue Plan, it remains at 37%. And as this body considers another 3.5 trillion in economic stimulus, should the exorbitant amount of existing unspent, unspent stimulus raise any macroeconomic concerns? Well, I think it's far, the least risky thing would be to spend that first or simultaneously with any additional funds that are that are passed. I, I believe that there are great risk in a large additional short run stimulus. Risk of inflation, uh, substantial budgetary costs, risk of uh, poor allocation of the funds. It's also worth pointing out uh, to pick up a point that uh, Wendy Edelberg mentioned in her uh, opening statement that disposable income of households is almost one and a half trillion dollars above projections. And that's almost exactly the amount of which savings are above where they would have been. So households have both saved and paid down debt, and they'll be able to spend as they become available as supply chain issues are resolved, as safety issues are resolved, as um, the pandemic is brought, hopefully, better control, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boskin. Uh, next question, uh, Mr. Ortiz, is in your written testimony, it says the City of Austin Homeland Security and Emergency Management Office is one of several public agencies charged with keeping our city and metropolitan area safe. And you work with public and partner organizations to protect our whole community when it needs us the most. And I understand the the Austin police force is down 150 officers since making the decision to defund the police. In my graphic here, you will see there's a quote from an Austin City Council member, 
quote, our primary response to problems as a local government is policing. Our community has come together like never before and demanded that change and a goalpost of 100 million reduction in the police force as a signal to that change. Well, the city of Austin did it. They made that cut. But it's actually more than 100 million. The Austin Police Department lost a third of its, its budget, $142 million. They failed to fill 150 open jobs. And on top of that, they've lost another 150 sworn officers. The result has been catastrophic. We all know it. We see it. Crime is spiking. Murders are up 71% over the last year. And sadly, it's the citizens that will suffer the most because of this irresponsible policy. So, Mr. Ortiz, has the dwindling police force in Austin changed your role or increased emergency management duties? Uh, thank you for this question. We, we, are, we have a really good relationship working with all our public safety agencies and departments in, in the city of Austin. And my understanding is that majority, if not all of that funding has already been restored to the uh, Austin Police Department. And we, and we have a commitment to work with all our agencies, not only within the city, but within the county and our surrounding regions to ensure that our response to uh, future disasters is, is the most effective and efficient as they can be. Thank you. So, so as the director, let me get this right, as the director for Homeland Security for the city of Austin, you would like to continue to see the size of your police force reduced, or would you like to see it go back to where it was before this irresponsible council member uh, and, and city council made such an irresponsible decision? Like I stated, my understanding is the majority of that funding, if not all, has already, already been restored to the, to the police department through the, uh, the budget process that they have gone through. Um, we are committed and, and we work and we have an excellent relationship with all our public safety agencies. And I know that our, our commitment to the community and to our region is there and we will be there to ensure that all future emergencies and disasters are coordinated and are as effective and, and efficient as they can be. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. And you seem to be a very reasonable man. And, and, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you will do everything you can to make sure that you can provide that safety and security to your residents. And, and uh, thank you for your time. Ms. Brownlee is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam. You might be muted, Ms. Brownlee, we can't hear you. COVID inpatient hospitalization rates uh, that are going on now in the United States, especially in states like Florida and Texas. Um, and uh, we're state and, and, and those states where the politicians are actively working to prevent implementation of common sense public health measures. So my question is, uh, can you discuss the impact these inpatient hospitalization rates are having on the economic recovery of these areas? Sure, uh, we, have, we have strong evidence that the surge in the pandemic from the Delta variant has depressed the recovery uh, across the board. Uh, one one uh, really obvious example is what we recently saw in employment. After months of increases in employment in the leisure and hospitality industry, in our last employment report, we saw no net change. That sector added no jobs. Uh, so it's still in significant deficit. People, uh, I think, facing the, the surge in the pandemic have pulled back on face-to-face -face services. And that's that's exactly where we, we need to see a strong recovery. So. Getting, getting a robust recovery goes hand in hand with getting the pandemic under control. Thank you for that. And um, also in your testimony, you noted the rapid upswing in demand for new automobiles. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that the new automobile buyers are individuals who are leaving transit due to concerns about COVID or are these buyers generally individuals 
wanting to replace older vehicles? Well, that's an excellent question, and and I don't know the answer. Uh, but but I can say that the that the increase in spending on automobiles has been part of a, a very strong spending on durables overall. Um, so I I wouldn't want to uh, I wouldn't want to separate it out. The households in the midst of the pandemic significantly and quite unusually pulled back on spending on services in a way that we've never seen in a recession before. And part of what they used that uh, that that the savings that um, that resulted is uh, to finance a surge in durables across the board and the spending on automobiles was part of that. Thank you so much. Um, and Mr. Scotilas, uh, the first thing that I just wanted to say to you is to really um, thank you and your members uh, for all the work you have done for all of us uh, to keep our nation moving. Uh, your frontline transit workers put themselves and their families uh, at risk to help other frontline workers like nurses and grocery store workers get to their jobs throughout the pandemic again to help us. And I know it's been devastating to have, uh, you know, 500 plus of your members uh, having died uh, from, from COVID. You mentioned in your opening remarks that transit workers are heroes and I concur uh, wholeheartedly and just, you know, really want to thank you and all of your members and please pass that along. How grateful we are um, for their service uh, during this pandemic. It, it, it's, uh, we are extremely grateful. So thank you. Um, I, you know, the question I wanted to really ask you too is, you know, just generally, if we were writing a bill tomorrow, what are the top things that Congress needs to do to keep our nation's uh, transit system functioning uh, as the economy now is slowly recovering um, and ridership is slowly rebounding? Well, thank you, Representative Brownlee. Let me say that I, I will pass that along uh, for the excellent words uh, that you've uh, shared with me. And, and let me tell you that the industry really appreciates you and, and, and the House of Representatives in Congress for the great support through this emergency funding that's allowed the industry to stay afloat, to keep operating. Um, you know, first, let, let me just say that uh, what is necessary is really contained uh, in the bills that's in front of you. The uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, as uh, was the case with the Invest in Americas Act, provides some uh, larger funding for public transit that is long overdue. Uh, every accounting of investment that we have made as a country in public transit comes down on the side to say that, that it's been underinvested. The report that I often like to cite because it includes all modes of tr transportation. The member's is time the has expired. It, I, I apologize, sir. I asked a question with little time left, so I apologize and I, and I yield back and we can speak offline. Ms. Still is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Burchett is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady. Um, Mr. Uh, Scutellis, did I say that name right? Yes, you did. Thank you. All right. Good. Burchett gets slaughtered all the time, so I, I just want to make sure I get it get it done right. Uh, do you believe it's the, the uh, role of the federal government to fund local or regional transit programs? I do, sir. Okay. W what percentage should the federal government be responsible for and um, what percent should be paid for by the state and locality or the rider fees? Because I know um, when I was uh, younger years, I was in the state legislature <laughs> and we had a, uh, uh, a study committee that, that basically said that uh, about 40% was the, the funding level I mean, I'm, excuse me, that they ran at about 40% efficiency, which meant 60% was either paid by state, federal, local, 
fees or funds and the and the ridership. I'm curious, is there a, a blanket, a magic number that you all would be acceptable to? There isn't a, a magic number. It varies really by size of agency and the financial structure of the agencies. I would say that on average across the country, we're at about a 35% uh, level of rider fees, rider fares for transit, and the rest some combination of uh, other revenues, whether it be state or local. And it really depends upon the financial structure of the organization. Uh, let's keep in mind that the bulk overriding dollars at the federal level go for capital investment for public transit. Uh, and that's really what uh, we're seeking uh, in terms of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, is the capital investment that's necessary to modernize our systems. And I think that that's a very appropriate uh, uh, role for the, for the uh, federal government. It's been a part of a 50 year partnership uh, that's allowed these systems to, to maintain and to grow, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we have talked here, and it's so true that it has been an underinvestment as well over that period of time. But we are seeking and believe the industry needs uh, robust investment on the capital side, uh, and that's where we believe that uh, the emphasis should be. Okay. Uh, Dr. Boskin, and I hope I got that name right as well. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. The, um, the reconciliation package includes roughly $60 billion in federal infrastructure spending, most of which is duplicative. Um, do you think the spending in this bill will result in even more useless or lower term projects like California's high-speed high rail project? I think there's a substantial risk, getting back to your previous question, if the matching ratio, let's say, is 80-20 federal, then local elected officials have an incentive to push any project, say, that has 30% of the of, that cost local people only 30% of the of the total cost. And so we have people in Florida and, and Georgia and Texas and Colorado and New York subsidizing people in California and vice versa on their projects in other places. So getting good projects is very important, getting the incentives right. 8020 has been the historical, uh, 9010 actually for Interstate Highway, has been historical, but that doesn't mean that that's uh, carved and sewn or it's sufficient and every project would make sense for it in general to be funding it now or in the future, as opposed to local and state funds being for a larger percentage. Well, I think re-examining that is probably long overdue, and uh, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of good projects out there if this is done carefully. You, you um, Dr. Boskin, you talked about the importance of national cost-benefit tests for infrastructure projects, and I was wondering, could you speak a little more on that, and as well, Congress should be doing what we should be doing to make sure that the federal dollars are spent wisely on a high, on high return projects that provides maybe some long-term benefits to society. Yes, sir. I think the important thing to focus on are things that have prospectively, we're investing funds with the hope that they'll pay off, things that prospectively have good returns, heavily repairs and maintenance, but in some case, new, new capital spending, um, that have interstate or national significance, not projects, not a lot, devoting a lot of projects to purely local things that where the overwhelming bulk of the benefits are received by local riders uh, without much national uh, effect. Now that doesn't mean there's no local project that's not uh, national or multi-state. For example, we have at the moment massive congestion at the ports in California. Uh, you know, investments that decongest those ports will get good to the people states more rapidly at lower cost. So I think that. Thank you, and Chair Lady, I yield none of my time because it's all run out. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Payne is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is for Dr. Edelberg. Uh, you know, we're in the pandemic right now of the unvaccinated. The only way to end the pandemic is for more Americans to become fully vaccinated. Uh, beyond the health impacts of people not being vaccinated, 
prolonging this pandemic continues to affect all sectors of our, the economy. Amtrak, United Airlines have already announced that employees must be vaccinated or undergo regular testing. Um, these and other employer vaccination mandates have proven largely successful. However, uh, these requirements only apply to their employees, not to passengers. Meanwhile, Canada recently announced that all air travelers will have to show proof of a COVID vaccine to board an airline, train, or cruise ship. Uh, if, more, if more transit operators such as railroads or airlines were to adopt vaccine requirements for passengers, would this result in more Americans choosing to get the COVID vaccine? So surely requirements to get vaccinated would, uh, would result in more Americans indeed becoming vaccinated. Um, one way in which we know that this is mattering is that um, if the people who you're serving, whether it's in a retail store or as a, as a transit operator, uh, the, if the people you're serving are not vaccinated, it means you, with, regardless of your own vaccination status, are at a greater risk by working around those people. And, and I think that this is one of the reasons why we've seen um, a, a frustrating slowness in matching workers with all of these job openings. Uh, our, our vaccine hesitancy is making it unsafe uh, for people to work in a lot of these in-person jobs. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Scutellis, uh, like my previous question, can you explain the practical benefits? Uh, can you explain the practical benefits of increased vaccination rates and transportation operations across the country? Yes, thank you, Congressman. Uh, well, first of all, I know that our transit organizations uh, by and large have uh, really stressed to the workforce uh, the, uh, the need to become vaccinated and have set up on-site vaccination sites, transported people to those sites to greatly encourage that. And it's been with mixed results. I think overall, if you look at the industry, it's probably a vaccination rate across the board that hovers somewhere above 50%, but not terribly higher than that. So there's a long way still to go there. Relative to users of the system, you know, for transit, given that these are open systems, uh, subway systems, buses, it's very, very difficult to be able to enforce that uh, among riders. Certainly to the degree that people protect themselves through a vaccination, through a mask, these are all positives in trying to keep everybody safe, not only the rider, but also the workforce. But I would say we've got a, a long way yet to do in terms of educating and encouraging people that this is really an imperative uh, for everyone's safety. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reagan, frontline workers, especially those working on trains, planes, and other transit systems, put themselves in harm's way every single day um, during the pandemic has been ongoing. How would high, a higher vaccination rate among American public better protect frontline workers? Uh, thank you for your question. Certainly a higher vaccination rate would reduce the risk for everybody, whether you're working in the trains or the planes <laughs> or on the buses or whether you're a passenger. Uh, I think vaccination is a really important part of getting us through this. And, and I hope that more and more people understand that as we continue to uh, bring back our economy and as more people get vaccinated, uh, more of the world is going to open back up to all of us. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, I yield back 30 seconds. Mr. Perry is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you much, Madam Chair. Dr. Boskin, you stated that funding from 2000, the 2009 American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act increased local construction payrolls by 30 cents on the dollar, but had no real effect on employment, just higher procurement prices. As a result, the government paid 6.2% more on stimulus projects and left about 335 million dollars on the table. That's real money where I come from. How do you, how do you think we ensure that future infrastructure invent, investments are actually spent on more projects rather than wasting taxpayer dollars on higher priced work? Well, from the studies I quoted, which are the 
most detailed academic studies of these things by respected nonpartisan academics. The basic story is if you throw a lot of money in a very short period of time in an area that doesn't have a substantial ability to expand production with new firms or with a big expansion of workers, you can't make uh, many of the unemployed today into uh, tower crane or giant excavator operators overnight, uh, then that's just gonna bid up prices and costs. And so the thing is to space it out, do this cost benefit analysis, make sure the sequence of projects doesn't flood uh, a local market where you're not gonna be able to get enough employees to actually get the thing done quickly and on time. And of course, there are all the traditional issues construction or potential cost overruns. That doesn't just play to public sector. It's probably worse there. But anybody who's remodeled their house knows that the cost goes up relative to projected budget all the time. So I think that careful cost management process, a serious analysis by the DOT or whoever's overseeing this to make sure that these are individual projects that make sense and they're not all crowded in one period of time in one, in one or a few places that they're respect the fact that the market is the supply of workers and firms very quickly uh, and doing these large public infrastructure projects. Hey, uh, Dr. Boskin, if you could uh, stay closer to your mic there, you kind of cut in and out. I'm going to truncate sure. some. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to move on because you talked about, I think, in, with Mr. Burchett, inherently parochial projects regarding modes of transportation that are politically popular. Uh, with some of my colleagues, but really have been largely rejected by the American people in the marketplace. And specifically, I'm referring, referring to the massive proposed increase in spending on transit and Amtrak, despite the minuscule amount of total passenger trip those modes represent and the uncertainty surrounding future ridership levels. In that vein, what are the long-term economic consequences of, of misallocating significant amounts of federal resources to said parochial projects based on political calculations rather than on actual demonstrated demand? Well, that could be a serious misallocation of resources. Funds would be wasted. Costs could be driven up. You miss the opportunity to do other projects that are higher, that are higher return or spend the money on other high priority uh, uh, public and private needs. And, and if I might ask, what do you think the risks are for providing a one-time infusion of stimulus as, as we're kind of staring down the barrel of right now in many places, funding for capital projects and system expansion, especially regarding transit to things to places like Amtrak or transit agencies that really can't even maintain their current systems? I think there's a, there's a balancing act between dealing with uh, agencies and uh, sectors of the economy that were particularly hard hit, that were heavily disrupted, where we had to provide a safety net to keep them from total collapse and potentially wasting money or uh, assuming that they're all gonna come back to exactly where they were before and then grow happily thereafter. I think you have to do the detailed analysis and uh, certainly uh, patterns will shift. For example, uh, in California, work from home has become an hybrid uh, uh, situations where people go into the office one or two days a week have become much more common, and many of the technology firms are making that permanent, not just temporary. So I think when you look at what the demand is going to be, you have to do that seriously and not just uh, based on fanciful numbers. Hey, uh, just one last question in the remaining time. Do you think that the bipartisan infrastructure bill that we're that we're potentially voting on today on the proposed recon or the proposed reconciliation package make the reforms necessary to ensure federal infrastructure investments actually produce a return to the taxpayer. I mean, based on what you read about it or heard about it. Well, what I've been able to tell, there aren't many reforms in them, and there are some uh, requirements that are that might drive up costs. We can argue that substantial reform will remain to be done if this is passed as currently. Thank you. Mr. Lowenthal is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I live in the city of Long Beach and I represent the Port of Long Beach, which is the second largest container port uh, in terms of volume in the United States. It's immediately adjacent to the Port of LA which is the largest container port 
uh, in terms of volume in the United States. And these two ports taken together are among the largest in the world. Uh, I'd like to preface my statement by saying the ports of LA and Long Beach are highly efficient. Both the workforce, the LWU, the terminals and the terminal operators strive to increase their pro proficiency and their productivity. Not saying that they, there is not more to be done, there is. Yet, as I walk down from my house down to the port uh, or down just down to the ocean and look out, as far as I can see, I see uh, container ships sitting out waiting to come into the port, uh, carrying uh, goods and uh, for the rest of the nation. So Dr. Edelberg, in your testimony, your written testimony, you mentioned how disruption of the supply chain and bottlenecks, and what I'm talking about is a major bottleneck, uh, as one of the key drivers of temporary increases in the price of many can consumer goods. This, poor, this point is a very critical point, so I want to spend a little time focusing on it. I'm sure that many of these disruptions in the supply chain, going from the port of Long Beach to wherever the goods will ultimately end up, uh, are simply due to the pandemic, uh, which you have pointed out, shifted consumption patterns. But it seems to me that a more resilient freight infrastructure system could have responded far more effectively to these bottlenecks. We can make infrastructure investments to strengthen these supply chains. And I think that the president and both the reconciliation package and in the infrastructure bill uh, can help accomplish this goal. I also believe that the appointment of John Pakari as the port envoy to the Biden administration supply chain disruption task force shows that the administration is taking this question seriously. But I'd like you, uh, Dr. Edelberg, to elaborate on how the federal government can more effectively coordinate and strengthen these supply chains. You're absolutely right that we have seen massive disruptions in supply chains and particularly in, in disruptions in the, the movement of container ships around the globe. And the underinvestment in ports in the United States has, has exacerbated that. But this is actually a circumstance where we can see disruptions in the, in the movement of container ships globally having an effect on boosting inflation globally. And this is one, just if, if I may, this is one place where it, we just have very clear evidence that the inflationary pressures that we're seeing are temporary COVID related. And, and, and it's misguided to think that, uh, that, these, that the inflation effects that we're seeing now, the inflation pressures that we're seeing now are largely the result of too much fiscal support. We are seeing these sorts of dis di supply disruptions around the globe partly from these disruptions in the movement of container ships, boosting food and food inflation in particular around the globe, uh, suggesting that when this resolves, inflation will come down. Thank you. I want to add one other, and I agree with you in terms of that global disruption. Uh, I want to add one more point for, for you to address. Uh, we're also seeing uh, a lack of actual empty containers to fill. It's not just the ports themselves, it's the containers that are not available. We're seeing that the distribution centers where the goods go, they cannot, they cannot accept any more goods, they're piling up. Uh, we can see the lack of trains that are coming in. We can see problems with demerge and detention and, and trucks. So we see this as a, a systemic problem. Can you comment on that? The, the, the developments that our economy and, and the global economy has had to absorb over the past 18 months are completely unprecedented. So you mentioned the, the, the huge uh, spike in demand of durable goods and how that's affected supply chains all over the globe. Um, this is, our, we did not have nearly a resilient enough supply chain to, uh, to, to absorb the crazy movements and demands that we've seen over the last 18 months. Thank you, and I yield back, and thank you.
explaining this kind of global problem that is going on. Mr. Westerman is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses today. I had another meeting that I was leading that started at the same time as this one, so I missed out on the early discussion today, but um, I found it ironic that we're having a meeting, the title of it, Assess Assessing the Federal Government's COVID-19 Relief and Response Efforts and Its Impact, Part 2. Uh, very long title, impressive sounding title, but um, I have to ask the question, does it even matter what we do in this committee as today uh, we're considering what I believe to be the, or we're supposed to consider, we were supposed to consider earlier this week, the largest infrastructure package from what I can tell in the history of mankind, a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package and never in a million years would I have guessed that there would be the largest infrastructure package in history on the House floor for a vote that did not come through this committee, that this committee has not had one chance to weigh in on that infrastructure bill. You know, even if you look at the, the New Deal, that was a, a $42 billion program, which um, in 2009, that inflation-adjusted amount was uh, still less than $700 billion, which was less than the, the big infrastructure program back then. But I find it um, rich <clears throat> that we're having a hearing on infrastructure when we actually apparently don't have any say in infrastructure in the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, I would just like to ask the, the panelists if they think it's more beneficial or less beneficial if on a massive infrastructure package, if we actually go through the committee process and pass a House bill and then go to conference? Do you think that's a wiser use of uh, American taxpayer dollars, or should we just allow the Senate to write every infrastructure bill and maybe even disband this committee since it apparently has no impact or influence uh, in the process? I'll, I'll open that up to uh, anybody that wants to answer it. Well, I'll go first. When I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for President George H.W. Bush, I worked closely with this committee as analog in the Senate, particularly Senator Moynihan, on what eventually became ICT. Was it perfect? No, but we made some improvements. And I think uh, relying on the expertise that people accumulate on, in the committees is a potentially very valuable input. And uh, from my own uh, viewpoint as a citizen, I'd love to see the Congress return to more regular order things going committees rather than these giant omnibus things being negotiated by the leadership with little input. I think it would be on balance, uh, despite all the problems and potential delays that might occur. I think on balance, that would be an improvement uh, most of the time. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Boskin. I would ag agree with that as well. Would any of the other witnesses like to talk about the importance of the congressional process in approving massive infrastructure packages and uh, how the uh, American taxpayer dollars can be used most wisely and effectively. Sure, I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm, uh, you know, in a position to be able to speak about congressional process. I think that's those are decisions that are up to be made by the elected leaders and those uh, in the various House and the Senate. Certainly as someone who worked in the House of Representatives, um, I believe in the institution, I believe in the committee process as well. However, what I can comment on in full in fully is that we support this bipartisan infrastructure bill. We think it needs to be passed. So you, you have the, um, the types of investments that we've been calling for for decades in transit, in Amtrak, in roads and bridges that need to be done that are long overdue. Um, and I think this is a good product that needs to be that needs to be seriously considered by everyone on both sides of the aisle. So if it's a good product, do you think it's good enough that it would withstand the rigors of going through the committee process in the House? I believe it's, I believe the entire house has an opportunity to make a, to make their decision on their own right now. No, we have no opportunity to offer amendments or to debate it. It sounds like we're going to have an opportunity to possibly vote on it, which personally I think is uh, a bad move for our country. I think it's a bad process. And what I would call on is all members of the house to finally stand up to the Senate and say, we're not going to pass this bill just like you sent it over, to 
to reject it uh, when it comes to the four and bring it to the committee because we're all interested in infrastructure. And let's show that this committee actually does matter and that the House actually does matter and that we do care about infrastructure and that we have something to offer. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Carbajal is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Eidelberg, uh, recently we've been hearing a lot about our national debt, uh, but it surprisingly, to me, it seems that it wasn't much of an issue of concern during the past four years, during the previous administration spending. There seems to be selective concern and situational about when we're concerned about the growing national debt. To his credit, Dr. Boskin has acknowledged that, quote, under President Donald Trump, federal deficits and debt remain massive by, by pro, pro, prosperous peacetime standards, unquote. As we know, before the COVID-19 pandemic, President Trump signed tax cuts into law that grew the national debt by trillions while largely benefiting the wealthiest in our country. From an economic perspective, can you discuss how good a return on investment we got on those tax cuts? Would we be better off and get a better return on that investment if we repealed some of those massive tax cuts to the wealthy to pay for the needed investments in infrastructure, lift children out of poverty, and help most working middle-class families get their fair share? So there's a, a lot there and let me, let me take it in a few different points. So first, let me say with regards to the, the current state of, of federal debt and the trajectory of federal debt, um, one of the places where we have the clearest signal of whether or not we have an urgent problem to solve is financial markets. Financial markets appear to be entirely unperturbed by the level of federal debt. Uh, interest rates are at remarkable lows and um, expectations for interest rates going forward uh, look like they're, they're, they're going to rise to more normal levels, but, but not, not into levels that should create concern. So we should think of our federal debt problem as a very long-term problem that we need to address. These are long-term factors that will eventually create uh, unsustainable upward pressure on our federal debt, but this is not a problem that we need to urgently face today. Uh, and, and for that, we need to look no further than financial markets. When it comes to uh, the economic effects of the 2017 Tax Act, so CBO estimated at the time that it would have a modestly positive effect on the economy. That was largely because of stimulative effects, because it, it sent money back to households that CBO estimated would in turn spend the money. The actual uh, positive effects on incentives to invest were, were only a portion of that positive estimated effect that, that, that CBO wrote about. And indeed, it, it, it looks like that's basically what we've seen for the last few years, a muted but positive effect on investment as a result of the 2017 Tax Act. So undoing a, a portion of, of the changes made in the 2017 Tax Act would would have just the opposite effect. It would have a muted but negative effect on the uh, incentives to invest. But of course, the big question is, what do we do with that money? And if in turn we choose to take that money and invest it in children, invest it in infrastructure, invest it in the long-term resiliency of our economy, um, that's a choice that we can make as a society. And I think it, it, it makes us stronger. Thank you so much. Mr. Ortiz, FEMA has played an important role in making COVID-19 vaccinations widely available. It provided more than 4.75 billion in support of vaccinations efforts in communities across the country and worked with state and local partners to establish more than 1,700 vaccination centers. Can you discuss briefly from your perspective what went right and what are some of the lessons learned to ensure we respond better and quicker and more effectively in the future. 
Um, thank you. That's a that's a really good question. Um, I think the uh, what we can say that uh, uh, this was something that is a uh, very large uh, uh, major effort for our country to uh, to engage with in this this past year. Probably the biggest thing that was very helpful was uh, how it was easier for our communities to um, be able to get some uh, um, expedited application process to establish vaccinations that that facilitated funding up front. Our communities across the country are are uh, are spending money in response to this pandemic, and it, uh, it 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 creates a situation that is difficult to be able to sustain these disasters. So I think that would be probably the best thing is the expedited uh, application process that FEMA put in place. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. I'm out of time. Mr. Balderson is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My first question, I want to thank all of you for being here. My first question is for Professor Boskin. Professor, in your testimony, you note the long-term economic effects of a new federal infrastructure program will not just depend on the level of spending, but also on the quality of the projects funded and their financing methods. Can you expand on this thought and provide any ideas on how we can assure that projects are fairly financed, will have positive long-term returns, and benefit our constituents? Well, as I said in my testimony, sir, I, I think the most important thing is to apply rigorous, as CBO has also said the same thing, rigorous national cost-benefit test. So there's a legitimate national purpose where benefits are accruing to, to citizens and the population broadly, not just in the local area where you wind up getting a bunch of projects that uh, if the rest of the country pays for it, we're glad to do. And then we wind up with massive fiscal cross-hauling where people in California are subsidizing other states and other states, citizens of other states are subsidizing California. And it creates the incentive to have some low, re, low national return projects because they look good locally because other people are paying a large part of the cost. So that would be point number one. Point number two is we traditionally have funded a larger and larger share of these with uh, user fees and gasoline taxes, and more recently, the idea of a vehicle miles travel tax to account for the fact that uh, we're growing the electric fleet, which obviously doesn't pay gasoline taxes, uh, would line up the, uh, the, the benefits received and the payments made so there'd be very little distortion to the economy. And people, the, the local officials and you in general, the, the, uh, this committee and your colleagues in the House and Senate, would have to respond to people feeling like they were getting their money's worth for what was going on. So I think those are some of the most important things. I think uh, whatever the amount spent is going to be, I'm sure it's targeted, effective, and cost effective, will probably be the single most important overarching thing to do. That's not easy. Um, horrible example of things going wrong, but of course, on balance, we've gotten some return. The CPU estimates about a 5%. Okay, unfortunately, we were having some technical difficulties there, Professor. Um, I will do a follow up. I, I didn't hear the last part of your answer, but um, would, would you agree that the current federal permitting and environmental review process, which can delay projects by over a decade, are a poor use of federal and state resources? Absolutely. I think uh, streamlining that process would be one of the single best things we could do to reduce cost, get target efficiency, make sure we finally actually spend money on is actually relevant to the time rather than a decades old uh, demand. Uh, and uh, we are much worse than most of the rest of the world in this regard. Thank you. Professor Boskin, in your testimony, you also mentioned your concerns that inflation risk are rising, a trend that more deficit finance spending will only accelerate. Can you give us a general overview of what a 3.5 trillion federal spending bill, which will likely add trillions of dollars to the debt, could mean to inflation in our economy? Well, of course, it's going to depend on the particulars and especially the time frame at which it's introduced and what else is done. But if we add this uh, substantial amount in the, in, in the short run when we have this inflation, we risk seeing more of it in inflation expectations, which can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, as we've seen in our history. I would add that while I generally agree with the comments that uh, Wendy made, I do want to emphasize that financial markets have often been badly wrong. 
they never got to expect the inflation of the 1970s. They badly misunderstood the disinflation of the 1980s. And as recently as when the Federal Reserve lowered its target interest rate to zero in response to the Great Recession and financial crisis in December of 2009, financial at 2008, financial markets expected it to stay there at nine months, it stayed there for seven years. So while I think there's little indication in financial markets that there's a big concern now, that could change quickly. And we ought, to, we ought to keep that risk in mind. It's not the only thing we should keep in mind. We should keep that risk in mind as well. Thank you, Professor. Madam Chair, will I yield back my remaining time? Mr. Stanton is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My first question is for Mr. Ortiz. Uh, early on in the pandemic, there were many reports of state and local emergency managers alleging that their orders for emergency supplies were getting redirected and not getting to the correct recipients. GAO found that found this in their audit work as well. They reported that states sometimes had trouble confirming that the supplies provided by FEMA were shipped to the right entities like hospitals or nursing homes, and that the supplies were the right ones and in usable uh, condition. I wanna get your thoughts on that. Why do you think FEMA initially responded in such a poor manner overall? What was your own experience in getting supplies from FEMA? Any ideas that you have for positive changes that could be made to improve FEMA, FEMA's response time to communities in need in, in the future? Yes, thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, let me start where I think uh, the, the biggest thing that we can do as a country in order to improve our capabilities. Uh, when we're dealing with the supply chain management, um, the issue is we can wait. The, 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 the need is here, is present at this point in time. So we need to be able to access local resources, supplies that are available to our local region. So the support and the establishment of local stockpiles local uh, staging areas that can work quickly and faster respond to the emergencies, especially in a pandemic, is, is critical. That can allow us to create a bridge to allow for the supply chain management to catch up and to allow the, all these other issues that we're discussing in this committee to, to allow for the additional supplies that may be uh, sourced from different locations to really uh, catch up and be able to build that, uh, that uh, proper response. That was the biggest challenge that we had. It created a situation where communities were having to basically compete with each other. Uh, and as I, the example that I presented earlier, uh, you end up where com not, you're not only competing with other communities, you're competing with, with your own state or with other states, and even at, to a certain point with the federal government. And what you end up resulting is a, high, a more expensive response because of price increases that at the end of the day is gonna, is gonna be a higher uh, cost to the taxpayers. Thank you very much. Uh, this next question is for uh, Mr. Catellus. We know that public ridership fell during the height of the pandemic. Too many people were unemployed or working from home, uh, sheltering place orders, et cetera. Uh, and so I just wanna get your take on this balancing act now. Uh, how are transit operators balancing fiscal constraints with the need to ramp up service to match passenger uh, demand. How does this, and how does it uh, vary from transit agency to transit agency? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. It, it really is right, right on the mark relative to the challenge that these agencies are facing. On the one hand, uh, the communities by and large are expecting them to provide the level of service that they've been accustomed to so that there's the pressure to, to really ramp up that service. At the other time, uh, on the other hand, uh, just matching the demand that's there uh, is the other part of the equation. And, and overlaid on top of that, of course, is the national uh, workforce uh, shortage issue that everyone is facing in every industry. And certainly it is in the transit industry as well. Um, I mentioned earlier in my remarks uh, that transit now has recovered uh, with ridership about 63% of what it was pre-pandemic. So we have seen a steady kind of a gradual increase in that. We would expect that to continue. Uh, and our agencies now really are looking to uh, modify their services. Many have already done that, uh, providing services where they know the demand is greater, uh, trying to be as efficient as they can be. And I would expect that's going to continue over the next 18 months or more as they get back to some degree of normality. Uh, our forecast is that uh, we're going to see by the surveys that we've done, 
uh, that across the board will have achieved as an industry about an 80% uh, recovery level in terms of ridership by the end of next year. That's great. My next question was going to be changes in commuter patterns, but you addressed that in your uh, answer. I appreciate it very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Still is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, um, Chairman DiFazio and Ranking Member Graves for hosting this hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for participating. The COVID-19 pandemic was greatly impacted all of us and our local communities. Transportation and infrastructure projects faced sharp drops in economic growth and employment. Supply chain disruptions have increased leading to further delays on important projects. It is important we continue to support policies that help economic recovery while also ensuring that our national debt does not continue to soar, leaving future generations to pay high taxes and bankrupting many important federal programs in the next few years. Inflation fueled by excess government spending continues to hit my constituents at the gas pump and at the grocery stores. In Europe, for example, inflation has almost gone up 1% in just a single month I bring this up as Secretary Buttigieg has previously claimed that the American dream is now in Denmark. Meanwhile, there is growing concerns on this committee regarding the administration's spending proposals and the effects we, they will have on our constituents. Some have argued that deficits don't really matter and wish to continue to build up debt. Having said that, I have questions for Dr. Boskin. Dr. Boskin, as we try to ad adequately respond to the COVID-19 crisis, what will happen to the transportation and infrastructure industry should we continue to go down a continued path of accelerating deficit spending? Historically, what has this strategy shown us? Uh, historically, uh, it often has led to problems down the road. Uh, sometimes these wind up in a, an abrupt financial crisis. More generally, I think the bigger risk is that it will slow growth over time, particularly when you add not only the high level of the debt anticipating adding to it now, but the additional debt that's going to become that's uh, represented by the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare that are coming due. So we're going to be we're going to have a big fiscal challenge in dealing with those in the coming decade, quite aside from adding this on. So I think it adds to uh, the risk considerably. Thank you, Dr. Baskin. I have another question. I appreciate you using California High Speed Rail Boondaggle as an example of a project that lacks support and has tripled in cost estimates. I introduced the Stop the High Speed Money Pit Act to prevent more federal funding to this waste of taxpayer dollars. With proposals from the administration and numerous transportation bills introduced on Capitol Hill to spend, spend, spend event more tax, taxpayer dollars, do you believe there is a lack of fiscal responsibility on some of these initiatives, and if so, how will this affect the taxpayers? Well, if there are poor returns, uh, taxpayers will be getting uh, a very bad deal, uh, and our citizens will be getting a very bad deal. With California High Speed Rail, I fully support. I don't know the details of your of your bill, ma'am, but I think that you're on the right track. That perhaps the single best thing with respect to that this committee could insist on is no funding, no additional funding for California high-speed rail and let it uh, let it evaporate as it should. That would be good for California, good for the rest of the country, and actually very probably the single best thing they could do for the legacies of Governor Newsom and Governor Brown would be to kill the project. Thank you, doctor. I have the last question. Transportation bill is important for all of us, better infrastructure, jobs, and trade in this important sector and to rebound from the pandemic. What areas of transportation do you think the committee should focus on in this Congress? Uh, and I have 
Uh, is that addressed to me? Yes. I, I think I think you should start with primary focus on traditional infrastructure and doing that well. Build out to these other areas that sound good, but have we don't have experience in pouring a lot of money in and getting good returns. Uh, whether that's early this or education that, et cetera, uh, I think those are fairly risky. And I would I would suggest. For those who support these things, let's do some pilot projects first and see how they pan out. If they work, important. Thank you very much, Dr. Baskin. And that's what I wanted to hear, and I yield back. Mr. Garcia is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and thank uh, Chair DeFazio for holding this uh, hearing. As a former union member and someone who represents a predominantly working class district in Chicago, I have fought throughout the pandemic for the workers impacted by COVID-19, both from health and economic perspective. Millions of working Americans lost their jobs, while uh, many frontline workers, tr like transit workers, had to go through the pandemic and some sadly died from COVID. The pandemic has had a disproportionate effect on working men and women, especially black and brown communities. And we must keep in mind uh, as Congress continues to respond to the pandemic. I thank the witnesses for appearing today. Mr. Regan, you highlight in your testimony uh, the lack of action by the Trump administration to protect workers from COVID. Uh, 19, uh, unfortunately, cost some workers their lives. Thankfully, the Biden administration has implemented some common sense policies like a federal mask mandate and increased access to the vaccine. But we continue to do everything to protect workers. What additional policies should Congress consider uh, or the Biden administration uh, should implement that can make sure that transportation workers are protected from COVID-19? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Uh, one thing we've discussed a little bit already today is the Transit Worker and Pedestrian uh, Prevention or, uh, Protection Act. That one would really help, especially bus drivers inside uh, their workspaces to help protect them from COVID-19, especially if they're designed correctly. Uh, I think continuing to have this mask mandate in place throughout all modes of transportation would be a really uh, welcome development. I know he's, he's doesn't seem to, uh, the president does not seem to want to lift that anytime soon, but that has proven to be to be uh, well received, and I think protected for people. But what we also need, frankly, is to have to make sure that there's support uh, of the employees so they're not being the mask police. I think at airports, you have a situation that's set up in order to make sure that there is an existing uh, law enforcement present that so that it's not going to be entirely on, you know, gate agents or, or flight attendants, but even there we're seeing problems. So whether it's been the increased fines you see on board aircraft, uh, whether that type of situation needs to be applied in other areas of transportation. I think these are things that the administration and Congress needs to look at. Uh, Mr. Regan, so it took a while for Congress to uh, implement protections against Amtrak furloughing, and you underscored it in your testimony. Uh, it's workers in uh, assistance to Congress uh, provided for Amtrak. Uh, this follows many worker issues we have dealt with over the years on Amtrak, including call center closures and the end of dining car service. Um, as we look at the future, what additional protections does Congress need to consider to make sure that workers at Amtrak are protected? Yes, I think thank you for that. We 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 um you know the, the way that the increasingly the aid that went to Amtrak, yeah, the labor protections got better and better, whether it be uh, you know, a commitment that they need to bring bring back furloughed employees and then ultimately um, you know, they required them to return furloughed employees and, and retain services. Uh, certainly, we should have limitations in the amount of out outsourcing that Amtrak can, can do for their existing services. Uh, right now, that seems to be the way that they deal with a problem they don't know how to solve is to outsource that work um, to somebody else where, where it, it usually is non-union labor and the wages and benefits are dramatically slashed when they do that. Um, so we should constantly be looking at ways to build up Amtrak and its workforce at the same time. Thank you. And uh, for Ms. Uh, Edelberg, uh, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that you see no compelling reason for the cancellation of unemployment insurance uh, benefits. Can you expand on why ending unemployment benefits early caused financial hardship for so many people? 
It always is an unforced error when Congress puts calendar date cutoffs into legislation when providing fiscal support to whether it's, <clears throat> excuse me, household or businesses, and even worse, abruptly canceling benefits. So uh, it would have been far better to tie those benefits, uh, the expansion and extension of unemployment insurance benefits to the state of the labor market, and in particular, the state of local labor markets. Um, that is a concern now as we see the Delta variant uh, can you know, surge to communities and you know, put in peril the, the labor market recovery. Uh, so yes, it, it gives me concern that now about five and a half million unemployed people who are actively looking for work no longer have any access to unemployment insurance benefits. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Gonzalez-Colon is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my question will be uh, the first one to Ms. Skutelas. Um, and, and this is this is a question that actually I related uh, from because of the situation with uh, with FEMA on the island and, and the money that has been approved and the money that is unused yet. You said in your testimony uh, that 69.5 billion dollars in funding that was provided by Congress uh, for transit uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, however, at this time, only 66 percent, 56 percent. Uh, it's been it's been spent, uh, which means almost thirty nine billion dollars. Um, do you think the rest of the funding is going to be needed, uh, or or not? Yes, thank you, Congressman, for for that question. Uh, based on the economic uh, forecasts that we had conducted, that were conducted on our behalf for the industry, uh, we had forecast that those resources would be needed to carry the industry through calendar year 2023. So taking us really to January of 2024. So um, a good percentage, uh, as you mentioned, of these resources have already been obligated. Uh, almost all of the CARES Act, half of the, uh, the CRISA Act, and more than a quarter of the most recent, the American Rescue Plan. And our agencies, the industry, is really um, parceling out those dollars so that they can continue to operate services while ridership comes back. And again, our forecasts, uh, while they're subject certainly to change because of evolving conditions, uh, it does appear that they're gonna need those resources to carry them through uh, being able to come back in some kind of a normal fashion, uh, roughly at the end of 2023. Given that that money that is already been obligated, um, do you think that the transit agencies may need uh, the additional $10 billion uh, from the Build Back Better, uh, given that there's still a lot of funding that is unspent uh, from, from the supplementals of COVID? Yeah, thank you for that question, because really those dollars are intended for different purposes. The, the three tranches of the emergency funding were for operations to sustain and stabilize operations. The $10 billion in the Build Back Better Act uh, it really is the shortfall that we saw in the bipartisan agreement for infrastructure, originally uh, proposing a $49 billion increase for transit, which was reduced to $39 billion. So we see uh, that $10 billion as really making up for, for that shortfall, which would all go to capital dollars, uh, as we understand it, uh, to support transit access to affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, I would love to make questions to Mr. Ortiz. Um, and, and this is something regarding to the emergency management uh, about FEMA. Uh, you said in your testimony that FEMA recaptures uh, disaster funds uh, based on some violations, uh, procedural rules, or even um, other principles. Uh, do you mind providing ex exact examples of what you're talking about? Because we are facing some of kind of this stuff in Puerto Rico as well. Uh, although FEMA, it's been engaging uh, with the state uh, stakeholders uh, to manage it. So I, I would love to know what specific situations are you referring to? Um, yes, and I can uh, give you a little bit more, um, more specific situations, but uh, as a whole, um, what while we agree that FEMA has that ability that was passed to them and under the uh, the, the 2018 Act, ability for them to re recoup those uh, those funds. 
but the way they're doing it in, in certain situations, uh, it's a it creates a uh, confrontational relationship where instead of focusing on the adequate response to ensure that the the the, the problems necessary to ensure that the the need resulting from the disaster gets addressed. Uh, creates a confrontational relationship where it may hinder or slow down the response efforts uh, by a local committee, a community because they're afraid to engage because of fear of of uh, of, of ex overextending themselves and not be able to be reimbursed because FEMA may ask for those funds in return. I, I think what we want to be able to do is create an environment where it's a it's a team effort, both at the federal, state, and local. Uh, in order to ensure that uh, the decisions are made uh, early and upfront and make sure that we're transparent in the process to, to uh, prevent situations where there may be misunderstandings or, or abuse of funds that are being uh, uh, utilized in response, but, and also at the same time expedite the response as fast as we possibly can. We are all working together. We all are uh, working towards the same common goal. Uh, but in certain situations, FEMA may put themselves in a situation where they, they're more of a, a, on an enforcement uh, side versus from a partnership side. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Carter is now recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my question is for Dr. Edelberg. The New York, New York Times reported this summer that states were working to cut off federal pandemic unemployment benefits for their residents, saying that the unemployment benefits are discouraging people from looking for work at a time when small businesses are having difficulty hiring workers. Uh, in my estimation, Dr. Edelberg, that has been um, quite the uh, contrary, that people, the notion that unemployment benefits are so high that people don't want to work, I think is a, is a, is a ridiculous thought, uh, particularly when juxtaposed with the option that a person has to work for $7.25 an hour, a meager, meager minimum wage. Um, instead of looking at questioning if unemployment is too high, perhaps we should really focus on the fact that um, minimum wage is way too low. Thoughts? Let me say a couple of things. So first, uh, we now have a lot of preliminary evidence that economists have gathered about what the effect on uh, employment gains has been from abruptly cutting off these benefits across the country. And, and you know, the, the evidence is even more compelling because we have this natural experiment of the, the, the benefits being cut off in different states in different times. The punchline is that so far, we have no compelling evidence that cutting off the benefits changed aggregate trajectories of what we're seeing in employment gains in any of these localities. And so, so that's the first fact. The other is that we, we obviously know that the, the increases in labor supply have fallen short of the increases in labor demand. Uh, job openings are at record high rates. But at the same time, we're seeing quits at record high rates and we're still seeing that firms are laying off workers. This is all to say there's a massive amount of churn in the labor market right now. And uh, the Hamilton Project just had an event yesterday where Betsy Stevenson made an excellent point from the University of Michigan. People are going back to work, but they are demanding that work be done on different terms than before the pandemic. They want more flexibility. They want higher wages. They want to be compensated for the risks they're taking if their face-to-face -face service sector jobs are now dangerous because of the pandemic. And they want more flexibility if they're going to have, if to be able to work from home. Um, so we are seeing big changes in the labor market that, and I know I'm going on too long, but these have <clears throat> also been made possible by the fiscal support that the government provided. Um, people are no longer financially utterly desperate. And, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. And it, and it speaks to the fact that we still have people that are um, women with children, families with children, caring for, for the aged or people that, that need additional care. 
And we know that elder care is terribly expensive. We know that child care is terribly expensive. Let me ask you, is there any empirical data as, a, as an expert, as an economist, um, any research that has been done on this topic um, that is uh, in an impact expanded unemployment benefits and labor force and its participation? So we, we do have a fair amount of evidence that suggests that if you, that, that more generous unemployment insurance benefits do slow down the rate of job matching. They make workers choosier about taking which job to get, um, but, but that's not altogether a bad thing. You want unemployment insurance benefits to allow people to find the best, most productive match, find a job that has really good, uh, a, a really good job ladder of career advancement. So yes, we have evidence that unemployment insurance benefits modestly uh, dampen job matching, but in a way that I, I think the policy, you know- And, that, and that's probably, and that's probably, and I'm, I apologize, trying to get through this real quickly, but yeah. in, in large, would you agree that, that when given the option of having to face all the factors that are out there like expanded, um, expenses for, for child care and elder care and those other uh, issues that families face, uh, a $7.25 minimum wage is, is hardly a living wage. One thing I'll say is that uh, with, with all of the mismatches we're seeing and the strength and labor demand that we're seeing, the, the private market is raising wages in a way that the federal government couldn't manage. We are starting to see a uh, really welcome uh, growth in wages at the bottom of the distribution. Can you expand? I'm going to switch real quickly. I'm going to stay with you, Dr. The gentleman's Robert. time has expired. I yield. Thank you. Mr. Guest is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Edelberg, I want to kind of expand a little bit and follow up on uh, what uh, Representative Carter was uh, just referring to. Uh, in looking at uh, your uh, report that was issued prior to your testimony, uh, you did talk a little bit about enhanced uh, unemployment insurance, uh, and I think you told Representative Carter that enhanced unemployment in insurance does, to some extent, slow down job matching. Uh, you also, on page 12 of your report, uh, you talk about uh, unemployment uh, today, that we have a record number of openings. You even say that this is the highest since 2000, uh, which was the earliest data available. Uh, we talk again about the slowness of job matching, uh, the, depressed lab, the depressed level of labor force participation, uh, and uh, the record number of individuals who have uh, quit their job and, and are looking at moving and are transitioning. Uh, we know across many uh, employment sectors and industry, uh, we're hearing that hiring is really the number one concern and has contributed to supply chain effects that have been felt across our economy. Uh, I want to turn to a little bit about the potential impact that vaccine mandates may have on that. Uh, and just so you'll know, uh, I have been vaccinated. My family has been vaccinated. Uh, back home, I have done public service announcements encouraging people to be vaccinated. Uh, but I do know, because I've talked to people, there, there are still individuals that have concerns uh, about uh, the safety of vaccinations. And so uh, we know that uh, President Biden uh, earlier uh, this month uh, spoke of an executive order uh, that would require vaccines for federal employees, uh, particularly those that are employed uh, in healthcare facilities, being Medicare, Medicaid. He also talked about testing or vaccination for uh, private sector employers that employ more than 100 uh, individuals. Uh, and we've seen uh, individual states, particularly the state of New York, uh, that have uh, recently applied either laws uh, that, that, that would affect uh, either specific industries uh, or uh, the state uh, employment as a whole. Uh, and uh, specifically, want to talk about unvaccinated uh, health care workers. Um, uh, as, uh, as we look, we see that recent uh, yeah. media reports have shown that New York hospitals have begun firing or suspending health care workers or defying a state order to get the COVID-19 vaccination. A recent uh, local media report said the New York City healthcare officials said that upward of 5,000 5, employees in the city's public hospital systems were not vaccinated. 
Uh, we know that that 5,000 represents 12% of the 43,000 work, workers in the public health care network. Uh, and the entire state, if you expand it out from New York City, New York State, 16% are unvaccinated. Uh, the Washington Post reported earlier this month uh, that an upstate New York hospital was going to stop delivering babies. We also know of reports of uh, surgeries uh, being delayed or canceled. Uh, and so uh, my question to you is that uh, in light of our current economic situation that have left employers currently struggling to find workers uh, to take many of these positions, even in cases where they've raised employment um, wages, uh, where they've offered signing bonuses, where they're offering flexible hours, can you speak to the effect that a federal vaccine mandate will have on the current trend of job openings and the, the trend that we're seeing of more individuals who are quitting their job? I think there are two competing effects here. One is, is the effect of having it as easy to work as possible. So as fewer requirements, the highest wage, access to child care, um, all of those things make it easier to work. Uh, you know, if, if, if you don't have a vaccine mandate, if it's okay if you haven't been vaccinated against measles, if it's okay if you haven't been vaccinated against polio, if, if the fewer requirements we put, Yes, we make it easier for people to work. On the, on the other side of the equation though, is that we've seen that there's a lot of hesitancy among people to go to work if they fear for their health. And where we're seeing a lot more hesitancy is in these in-person service sector jobs. And so the more, the more we, we put those people's minds at ease, that it is safe for them to work, we, we should see that dominate and actually greater labor force participation instead of less. Well, and, and my concern, Dr. Edelberg, is particularly in the field of healthcare, uh, of uh, education, and now we're seeing law enforcement, that we're going to have individuals who are experienced in their field who are going to no longer feel like, and in many cases, are not legally going to be able to continue their work. And, and I think that that is very dangerous as we're seeing the, the trend that we're seeing uh, in the unemployment. And so, it, uh, Madam Chairman, I think I'm out of time, so I will yield back. Mr. Brown is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the panelists uh, for a very enlightening uh, a discussion. Uh, thank you for your responsiveness to all the questions uh, asked by uh, each of the members. Um, look, uh, it's critical that we examine ways uh, to improve oversight of the COVID-19 pandemic relief funds uh, while uh, also evaluating the significant impacts that these relief efforts have had on supporting um, sectors across uh, the country and the economy. And we're focusing uh, today, I think mostly on you know the transportation sector and its workforce. Uh, nationally, transit ridership in 2020 was down an historic 79% um, at the start of the pandemic compared to 2019 levels. However, when the pandemic hit, public transportation systems uh, really didn't miss a beat. Uh, certainly not uh, in uh, in in my congressional district uh, and supporting my constituents. Uh, systems like the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Administration, we all know it as Metro, uh, continue to you know, bring healthcare professionals to the front lines, uh, allowing folks to go to the grocery store, pick up prescription drugs, uh, connected other essential workers to their place of work. Uh, prior to the pandemic, transit agencies collectively spent, spent less than 0.5% of their budgets on workforce development. Um, I believe it's imperative that we take these lessons learned and focus on preparing our essential transit workers to ensure they have the tools to meet the challenges of tomorrow. I've got a bill in that, that does it, that. It addresses these workforce development uh, issues by establishing the National Transit Workforce Training Center. Um, so I, I believe that this is needed now more than ever uh, after witnessing the impacts that the pandemic has had on our transit workers. So Mr. Regan, well, let me ask you this, as these transit systems come out of the pandemic and adopt new equipment and practices, what level of investment is needed to prepare our workers for the next generation of transit jobs? And how can a national transit workforce training center better prepare transit frontline workers for the post-COVID world? Uh, thank you for the question. And thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, right now, there is 
uh, virtually no dedicated money money for transit workforce training. Um, we fought through the, for the appropriations process for years to try to address that, but but uh, having a dedicated funding stream will be a huge impact and make sure that we have the most uh, the best prepared workforce in our transit sector. Um, a centralized workforce training center, one that is a joint labor and management effort, uh, such as the one that you have championed, allows labor and management to work together cooperatively uh, to identify new technologies, new trends in public transportation, um, outstanding training needs and skills gaps, tools for re better retention in good transit jobs. Uh, as we move from our current fleet to EVs, for example, or implement driver assistance, assistance technologies, uh, workforce training can provide evidence-based training materials and engage in activities like um, train the trainer to ensure a smooth rollout of these new technologies. Uh, and one that includes worker voice and how and when these technologies are implemented, uh, we think is a vitally important thing. And, and uh, again, I can't thank you enough for your leadership here. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Boskin, uh, I think the chairman uh, DeFazio asked you this. I, I kind of had something else going on in my ear, so I apologize for being redundant in my question. But can you just say again, what are the risks associated with not raising or suspending the debt ceiling on October 18th, assuming for the purposes of my question that October 18th is the date that the US Treasury has exhausted its extraordinary measures to meet our obligation? What, what are the associated risks? Well, I think there would be a short, in the short term, there'd be a considerable disruption in financial markets. And if it wasn't more or less instantly revolve, uh, resolved, uh, that could spread to the real economy and injure the economy. Now, I know that you are a tax and budget policy expert and that you dedicate a lot of time to reviewing the works of other economists. Um, in, in your opinion, uh, and also that of sort of the literature re you review of, of economists, is, is a debt ceiling, and the United States is one of a few countries that actually have a debt ceiling. I think Denmark is another one and it's in the stratosphere. Is a debt ceiling limit an effective way to manage debt? Well, I think that uh, the idea of having a debt ceiling was obviously to put some pressure to, uh, to, to not raise it. Uh, but obviously, in the end, we've wound up raising it anyway. So I think it's hard to say what the debt would be if we never had it. Uh, I think more generally, when Congress has tried to put various constraints on itself, on, uh, we so I think that a general the gentleman's thing. time has expired. Thank you, Dr. Boskin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I now recognize myself for five minutes. My district is home to the nation's busiest airport and one of our nation's busiest rapid transit systems. It goes without saying that I have a lot of constituents working in the transportation sector. The pandemic has hit all of these constituents really hard, but what's been particularly alarming is how much it has disparately impacted groups. In July 2020, unemployment among female transportation workers reached a record of 26.2%. This is over 10% higher than the overall industry unemployment rate at that time, which was still way too high. Transportation employment is coming back, but it is not fully recovered yet. As recovery proceeds, we have to ensure that it is equitable. Ms. Edelberg, how, how could factors like increasing the accessibility of quality, affordable childcare help combat disparities in employing transportation workers? Oh, absolutely. And we have a great deal of evidence that increasing access to affordable and high quality childcare access to family and medical leave, stable housing. We have so much evidence that these policies uh, make our economy more resilient, make our labor force more resilient. I keep hearing over the course of this hearing about how we need more evidence. We have the evidence that these programs work. Thank you. Last week in the aviation subcommittee, we also heard about how air rage affects worker safety, but this kind of rage could also affect the recovery of the transportation sector at large. Mr. Regan, if we can stop rising incidents of rage and assault across modes of transportation, what boost could that provide to the transportation sector's labor participation and passengers' willingness to travel? I think it would be a massive boost. Uh, certainly people 
hear all these stories about, about bus drivers and flight attendants being assaulted. They see the images on board trains of people uh, acting out. That is going to suppress uh, the demand to travel for a lot of people. And it's also more importantly going to uh, suppress the demand for people to, to enter these professions and work in these jobs, despite the fact that they are by and large good union jobs with, with decent wages and good, pen, good benefits. So um, I think it's a really serious issue we need to deal with both from a labor perspective and from a, from a economic demand perspective. Also, Mr. Regan, in your testimony, you mentioned that federal assistance has been vital for the transportation sector. As Congress works to make transformational investments in our nation's infrastructure and people, what specific investments are most important to ensure the transportation sector recovers, employs more individuals, and actually builds back better? Thank you. We, the, the investments in transit, Amtrak, roads and bridges, those are all vital to make sure that we have a modern infrastructure system that will be competitive uh, throughout the world. We need to make sure also that there are strong labor protections attached to those. So, so it, will, it will have the uh, added economic benefit of making sure that people uh, have more good jobs and are able to be more active participants in the economy. Uh, so things like uh, bacon protection by America, 13C in transit, all of these, and, and certainly the pr pr protections that were in the uh, COVID relief bills, extending those further, all of these will have the effect of making sure that we have the greatest economic return for our investment when it comes to infrastructure. Thank you. And with that objection, I'd like to insert the definition of social justice into the record. Do I not object to myself? Without objection, so ordered. And I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Moulton is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to just thank all the witnesses um, for sticking it out. Uh, I know this is a long time to be uh, staring at a computer screen um, and uh, really appreciate your your willingness to be here and to, to help us out. Um, I, I'll try to be quick. Dr. Boskin, I just wanted to go to you be, uh, because earlier you told my friend, Mr. Burchett, uh, that high speed rail funding and reconciliation would be Florida, Texas and Georgia taxpayers paying for California high speed rail. Now, in fact, you chose states that all stand to benefit from high-speed rail funding with projects in various stages of the pipeline, and you could add to that the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, the Northeast, and the Southwest. I'm just curious, I mean, would you have told Congress in the 1950s not to put forward federal funding for interstate highways when only a small handful of states uh, actually had projects that were shovel-ready and, and, and ready to go, uh, even though obviously they would eventually be part of a much broader interstate system? No, a, a viable interstate system was important. It was first laid out actually by President Hoover and I think President, under President Eisenhower, the Congress uh, uh, supported it. And I think it's been uh, on balance really important. It's also important to know that we have probably uh, reached diminishing returns and expanding it, it's, it already exists. Uh, so yes, if, if things are primarily localized, they shouldn't be funded by taxpayers generally around the country. They should be funded by people in the local community, either by user fees or congestion, uh, congestion charges, which I should have emphasized more in my oral testimony, it's my written testimony, to avoid the need for additional uh, capital expenditures where possible. But no, of course not. And if there's a viable interstate connection that really has broader benefits, then that's legitimately a partially a federal responsibility. The estimates, I've not seen a more recent one, the estimates that Ned Granlick, as I mentioned earlier, uh, President Clinton appointee to the Federal Reserve made of the local traffic on the interstate highway system was 70%. So if these systems are important to legitimate benefits accruing broadly to the country, uh, if they decongest a port, if they really do connect many states and throughput, then that's a legitimate uh, avenue for potential federal funding, absolutely. 
Well, that's great. I mean, because I think that's exactly what if you if you know if you look at a high speed rail analysis uh, across the country, I mean, you see that a lot of these projects are conceived within states, uh, like for example, California high speed rail between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, if you look at uh, the the Vegas project between LA and uh, and and Las Vegas, there's a there's a whole Southwest network coming out of uh, kind of Phoenix, and they're kind of conceived in these. Uh, these uh, 500 to 1,000 mile corridors. But what's striking about it is the corridors are all contiguous. When you put them together on a map, it does in fact uh, form a national system. And I think that's something that hasn't been uh, emphasized enough by, uh, by people like myself, frankly, um, or part of, the, uh, part of the debate. One of the benefits of that is that when you get to a point where you can take high-speed rail from Los Angeles to Chicago, for example, um, that's a distance that most people will still fly, uh, but it's a great distance for, uh, for high-speed freight. Uh, and as we know, there's a lot of uh, business there of everyone ordering things on Amazon and all uh, these days. Um, and uh, it would be far more efficient and also a tremendous revenue source for these systems uh, once they're built. You know, we've transferred $158 billion in general funds, not user fees, to the Highway Trust Fund since 2008. So uh, clearly we have a, you know, a user fee issue there, but I think we certainly want to get to a point where, where people see the benefits uh, both locally and uh, nationally uh, with high-speed rail. And, and I think that, you know, if, if anything, I take away from your testimony that we need to, to make that case um, more convincingly. One of the facts of the California system that I actually... Um, I got into at Harvard Business School and doing a financial analysis of the proposal is that uh, that even with the cost overruns, which there absolutely have been, no question, uh, it's still less expensive uh, than meeting 2050 uh, transportation demand by expanding airports uh, or expanding highways in the state. Uh, but then you also get these accessory benefits where you have additional capacity at 2050 um, that wouldn't exist uh, from the from the alternative. So at the end of the day, we should be taking an economic lens to these uh, to these projects and looking at their their full economic returns, but not just looking at them in a vacuum, recognizing they could be part of a federal system and also recognizing how they compare to alternative ways to meet uh, transportation demand. So uh, appreciate that very much and thank you. I yield back. Mr. Auchincloss is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to the witnesses, I, I appreciate your patience and persistence over a long day. Mr. Skatoulis, I wanted to ask you about the use of American Rescue Plan funds by state transit agencies. The American Rescue Plan wasn't just about getting shots into arms. It wasn't just about putting money directly into the pockets of, of people who were impacted by the recession. It was also, in some ways, an infrastructure bill. It provided significant sums to state and local agencies uh, with the intention being they had relatively wide discretion to spend those monies over the next three years on, uh, on capital improvements. One of the frustrations I've had over the last six months, though, is seeing that some of the state transit agencies are expressing doubts about how much latitude they actually have to spend ARPA funds on ADA improvements to our commuter rail stations, on improving service and reliability of light rail in greater Boston. Can you speak to uh, what advice you're giving to your to your constituencies on that issue? Sure, thank you for that question. Well, first and foremost, uh, the the major thrust of uh, dollars and resources uh, from the American Rescue Plan was really to continue to provide uh, operating dollars to the agencies to keep right. them operating through this pandemic. While the definition also provided that if they were uh, they had an adequate amount to continue with those operations. Mr. Skatulis, I, I apologize. You're just, you're, your volume is not coming in. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the other aspect of the rescue plan funds was to provide uh, the ability to be able to use those for some capital improvements, provided that they first met the operating needs, meaning keeping their workforce intact, operating service levels uh, that were necessary for their communities. So, um, what we are seeing is that the great majority of agencies are using those dollars and need those dollars for operating purposes to continue to operate. Uh, and that is the guidance uh, that I think and feedback that we get as we talk to the agencies. It doesn't preclude an individual uh, capital improvement if they can do it, but it has to be within the context of continuing operation. Can we work with your office 
uh, as we talk to state agencies on encouraging them to, as you say, as, as, they, as they account for operating expenses to also be looking at capital improvements? Certainly would be very happy to engage with you uh, on this and any other related topic. I appreciate that. I know that many of my constituents have been looking for improvements to the commuter rail and to the, to the green line that ARPA prevents, presents hey, a once in a generation opportun opportunity mm -hmm. to, uh, to invest in. I I'd like to do that. May I add just one point to that? Please. Uh, it really underscores the need to pass the, invest, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that's before you, which would, really would provide uh, additional investment for public transit, as well as uh, the highway system. Uh, that's really where the capital dollars reside uh, and would be very much uh, needed to continue the modernization of our transit and commuter rail systems. You also mentioned uh, operating expenses, and, and one of the ways that operating expenses are paid for is through fares. Uh, these fares, though, when accounted for, for the costs of administering and enforcing them, really are a marginal part of the operating revenues for uh, the T and the commuter station in, in Massachusetts. And I've been a strong proponent of, of a free the T movement, where we really zero out fares for MBTA and commuter rail service I want to open this up to the panel, but especially, especially Dr. Edelberg and, and Dr. Boskin, uh, if, if you have thoughts for how zeroing out fares might induce more ridership and actually on, on, at a social level save money uh, by reducing congestion. Well, I would, if you're zeroing out fares in off peak times, that would perhaps make sense because it would shift people from congested times to less congested times. Generally, lowering the cost to somebody increases their demand for the service, which would, if it was done in peak times, would increase congestion. Dr. So Boskin, I'll, I'll reclaim my time, just so I, I want to give uh, Dr. Edelberg a chance to respond as well with 40 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. So we know that, um, I, I mean, I, I think what Dr. Boskin has in mind is that you want to you want to charge people during during congested times so that they absorb some of the cost. They, they factor in some of that cost when making that decision about when to ride. And, and that's why I think user fees are, are, are effective and efficient because um, they, they align all of the incentives correctly. However, uh, first you have to make sure that you know, it, it creates all of these complications with how people are doing the comparison to other forms of transportation. Right. Because I think what you have in mind, they're also regressive and that makes them complicated. And many people I would note before I yield back my time can't choose when they have to commute. Correct. I yield my time to the chairwoman. That concludes our hearing. The gentleman's time has expired. I would like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony today. Your comments have been very informative and helpful to our work on this committee. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.